Um, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister this morning and this afternoon gave us an expose of what is in her heart with respect to the work of the cabinet and the government at this time. She began by indicating to us that there were some clear goals which she and by extension the government had set for itself given the context in which we operate now. That included the intention to protect the most vulnerable at all costs and to have government step up to the plate in the absence of private sector economic activity and by its capital works program spur uh, on employment in the spur capital works projects through the public sector in order to generate um, employment. She underscored the importance of enhancing competitiveness with the aim in mind of ensuring equitable growth that includes growth in the numbers of people employed and their ability therefore to have a spend in the economy which would have the, the obvious ripple effect across the economy. Those are laudable goals and not to be scoffed at. I do query though the evidence with respect to necessarily doing the best that it can to protect the vulnerable and also the whole issue of equitable growth that generates employment in Barbados at this time. She also set her presentation against the backdrop of what government has been able to do since coming to office in 2018 with respect to managing its debt in particular. And perhaps that is where I would want to start. She did insist that we did not borrow in 2018 and that government should be lauded for that. I wonder if it is not nearer to the truth or the fuller truth in that government was not in a position to borrow and not necessarily that out of a policy perspective it was not disposed to borrowing. Because I don't know that the Barbados of 2018 would have found any commercial entity anywhere that would lend it lend its money to Barbados. I don't know that government in the context of pursuing an IMF extended fund facility program was in a position to borrow outside of that which came at the hands of the IMF itself at that early moment in proceedings. So I think it is nearer the truth to say that the government of Barbados could not borrow and not that through policy prudence determined that it would not borrow at the time. Now there are some significant realities revolving around the issue of debt and debt management in Barbados. You have a two plus billion dollar revenue intake projected. And uh, I, I'm working, Mr. Speaker, with the figures to which I had early access and there may have been slight, some slight amendments to these figures and I'm sure uh, even hereafter we may still find <laughs> some amendments. But of the two plus billion, 2.6 billion projected for revenue intake, 30% of that, Mr. Speaker, 800 plus million will be applied to debt service in the year ahead of us. 818 million to be applied to debt service. Now that is a serious and significant reality. You can look at the allocation for the respective ministries. 
Prime Minister's office gets a lot of money, millions of dollars. The Ministry of Health gets a lot of money, a hefty allocation, hundreds of millions of dollars. The Ministry of Education, of course, gets the lion's share, over 500, nearly 600 million dollars all told. If you talk of statutory and non-statutory expenditure, the significant reality for us here is that in order to service our debt, we are committing to have to commit, to have to spend more than any of the ministries have been allocated in the year ahead. It's more than we're going to spend on health. It's more than we're going to spend on housing. Clearly more than we're going to spend on elder affairs and people's empowerment. It's more than we're going to spend on education. We're going to spend it on debt service. Now, that is the reality. If we are going to have a fulsome debate, and if we're going to have accurate reflection on our realities, that is one that you can't just ignore. That debt service, from my figures here, will total 800 plus million dollars in the year ahead. Now, debt by itself is bad enough. Debt that is unmanageable is worse, as we have found. But we're talking about the management of high debt levels in a specific context. And the context that I want to underscore is the context of the absence of growth. Some would suggest that we are generating sluggish growth. In comparative terms, perhaps meaningless. There's the absence of growth in the Barbadian economy. Those who had projected a certain level of growth this year, across Barbados, across the wider Caribbean, across the hemisphere, of certain levels are suggesting that there would be, barring any unforeseen further future developments, a level of growth, but they're doing so with reference to what we have been experiencing over the last year and in the context of COVID. If you fall into a 40-foot well, that's the Prime Minister's 40-foot well. I think she made reference to today. If you fall into the Prime Minister's 40-foot well, Mr. Speaker, and by dint of some luck or somebody's initiative or even your own initiative, you manage to get up to 20-foot depth in the well, you are still down in the well. Your experience is that you are still in the well. So the growth projected across this hemisphere, across this region for this year, for the future devastating shocks not considered, is growth based on what has been the experience in the last year. And Barbados beyond the last year, in the past several years, has been experiencing a circumstance of very low growth or no growth. So debt in that context takes on a different face. It, it, it is seen in a different light. You see, Mr. Speaker, if you owe some bank in some town somewhere in this world, one million dollars, that's a lot of money. But if you have many and multi-millions from which to draw, 
then, Mr. Speaker, that does not trouble you. And I pick on you, Mr. Speaker, with your pardon, because I know perhaps the illustration is more relevant if I should so choose you and not choose any others in the, in the House. Um, that is, honorable <laughs> members, on what basis? <laughs> As based on appearances, sir. <laughs> on mere appearances, sir. Reputation. <laughs> but if you owe that same million to some bank, and you have only a couple thousand, then you are in serious straits. So we can't simply look at the absolute figure. We have to look at the context that constitutes the reality. And you're talking about paying a high level of debt service in a given year in a specific context when there's nothing in the Barbadian economy that is suggestive of growth. Barbados has always had a certain level of debt, and especially in more recent times. Under the last Barbados Labour Party administration, there were growing levels of debt, domestic and foreign debt. But the country was in a position to manage that debt and to use its debt to inspire and trigger and gender further growth in the economy. Subsequent to that, we had burgeoning debt, burgeoning debt in the context of declining growth and contracting economy. In the last three years of the former administration and in the first five or seven years or so of the, in the last three years of the Arthur administration, last five or, in the first five or seven years or so of the former administration, my reading tells me that the Barbados economy grew on an average of about 1%, on an, an average over a 10-year period, of about 1%, while the debt levels grew by 174%. I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, it matters the level of debt when the reality of the growth dynamic is brought into the picture. It is not enough to say to Barbadians that we are managing our debt well and that prior to COVID, we had reduced it from about 180% of our GDP down to what, 119, 120%. COVID has come and caused that, that debt has escalated again. It is not enough to say that without making reference to the growth reality. And the growth reality for Barbados has not been a strong experience. Part of the context in which debt levels and debt management must be considered, Mr. Speaker, is the fact, the reality, that there are generations behind us that will have to repay the debts which now this government, this country at this time creates. They will have to pay, Mr. Speaker, against a backdrop where there's no certainty of job opportunity. No certainty of job opportunity. And that was prior to COVID. COVID has exacerbated the situation. No certainty of job opportunity for these young people behind us when they come to the doors of the job market. There is the issue of suitability of employment. We, even at this moment, and again before COVID, had a situation where 
People are graduating out of our tertiary level institutions with fine qualifications, Mr. Speaker, but not an opportunity to find a job, a job that matches those qualifications. So we're creating debt for people behind us. Some of them are offspring who tomorrow in the medium term and in the distant context will have to repay this debt and we are not creating the environment within the context of which they are likely to find a job period or a job that produces a satisfactory level of income that helps them to meet their needs and those of their family and contribute productively to the growth of Barbados. And we're creating debt for them. When we create debt, we don't do it in a vacuum. We don't just create a situation where numbers are inscribed on accounts somewhere And there's a formula for repayment worked out between creditor and debtor, and that's it. It's more than a numerical reality. It is a living reality, the harshness of which will impact upon those who have to repay the debt. We lament that Barbados struggles today to repay existing debt. We chastise the last administration for the levels of unproductive debt which allegedly they created. But we do the same thing against that backdrop, that reality, that those who come behind us have to repay. And that's all right if in having created that debt, we have used that debt to facilitate a space, an environment in which they're going to find employment, meaningful, gainful employment, and therefore will be empowered not only to repay that debt, but to make a life for themselves and family and contribute productively to the Barbados economy. The governor of the Central Bank of Barbados in Given a review in 2020, suggested that our economy declined by 17%. Yet, in that context of declining growth, in that context of economic constraints, or constraints in, in the economy, loans from international financial institutions that we incurred amount to over a billion dollars. Now a lot of that may be COVID related, COVID induced, COVID generated, and that's understandable. But at the end of the day, it is still debt. And at the end of the day, it is debt which has to be repaid. And I don't think a lot of Barbados, I shouldn't say I don't think a lot of Barbados, there are many, too many Barbados who perhaps do not understand that a lot of the money that we've been able to access in the last several months, money we have to repay. We may boast that the interest rate at which we repay is 1%, as opposed to what obtained previously, what you'd get in and the international financial community. And we're glad for concessionary terms for accessing these loans. But at the end of the day, it is still debt to be repaid. 800 plus million in that service in this year more than any allocation to any of the ministries. So the fuller story on the issue of debt has to be told. It is not sufficient to say we were managing well we reduced the debt level. We had to incur fresh debt 
because of COVID. We have incurred debt at significantly low interest rates. All that is true, but you have to give the fuller context so that those of us who look on, who are not part of the decisions necessarily, are made aware that we have to repay, our offspring must repay it out of a circumstance where that job may not be there, or that job may be there in a context where it does not pay me enough, or even if its pay levels seem to be reasonable, then the cost of living, taxation, cost of living is such that my disposable income is significantly reduced or altogether obliterated. A fuller picture has to be given. I've said before and I say it again, and I think it is true. I think the government has been engaged, is still to some extent engaged in constructing a survivalist platform rather than a launch pad for growth. And there are some who in defense of that posture may suggest it is absolutely necessary lest the country go under such that we are in a position to provide a safety net for folks and at least sustain life in the Barbados economy. But I think that the government came to office representing to the people of Barbados that in its view the prior 10 years were years of stagnancy, stagnation, and all of the rest, all of the rest, and that it was positioned, if given the opportunity, to lead us into an era of growth, can't simply make the excuse that COVID has stopped us in our tracks. Because prior to COVID, what we were doing is constructing a survivalist platform rather than a launch pad for growth. My numbers suggest to me that we're spending 20 odd million dollars more in the year ahead than would have been spent in the last year. But we are doing this against a fall off of 1.4 billion in the economy. Now a few million more in the context or against the backdrop of a fall off of 1.4 billion begs the question as to whether or not that is enough. Is it enough to spur growth? Is it enough to spur meaningful growth? And if you look at the estimates, is the spending being strategically allocated, bearing in mind the context in which we now operate? in which we now operate. Now, I looked at the figures here. I see no increase in the funds for the Barbados Investment Development Corporation. We're talking about thrust in international business. We're talking about penetrating markets. We're talking about securing new, fresh, more viable investment initiatives but no significant increase in the funds allocated to the Barbados Investment Development Corporation. And in these very estimates debates, we have heard in loud terms as to what is anticipated in the hands of the BIDC, but no substantial increase in funding to the entity. So we have to question how strategic have we allocated these funds if things like that remain the case. Now I think in so far as the creative economy that operates out of the Prime Minister's office 
There's an allocation of $260,000. $260,000, and Mr. Speaker, if my figures differ from yours, you'll pardon me because you know how these errors get into these documents and we can't sometimes keep up with these documents. And I, may I say, there are always errors in estimates. But Mr. Speaker, I have found this year it, is, it has been atrocious. The level of error that is in these numbers. Huge errors. <laughs> numbers don't add up. Make no sense. But that's another story for another decade. But my numbers suggest $260,000 to the Ministry of Creative Economy, led by my honorable friend, out of St. Philip West, located now in the Prime Minister's office. And that, despite the fact that we need to have, to, de to find, to, de to discover, to develop new areas of enterprise, we have said that we've got to change the strategic direction of the Barbados economy and enhance our efforts to generate growth build out the economy, export products and services, encourage entrepreneurship and a spirit of industry among our very creative and talented minds. And the Ministry of the Creative Economy, $260,000, despite the fact that we need to find these new areas of endeavor and enterprise. And against the backdrop that this sector is generating about four to almost five trillion dollars globally, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, four to five trillion dollars globally generated by this sector, a very important sector, an area of public endeavor led by my honorable friend. 260,000, sir, you question as to how strategic we have been in allocating these funds, 11 million or so to the BIDC, 260,000 to a, a sector that generates globally almost five trillion, not, 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 not million, not billion, Mr. Speaker, to use the Prime Minister's words, we are not talking as children when we talk trillion. There's enough, 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 and then enough money. The kind of figures, Mr. Speaker, that it is hard to deal with in mathematical terms. But 260,000 in an industry area that generates almost five trillion. So you ask yourself, how serious are we about helping to develop the talents of our creative minds? How serious are we about the business of building the entrepreneurial spirit in Barbados? How serious are we when we speak of pride and the industry? How serious are we about our young people how serious are we about the understanding of which we boast relative to the use and availability access to technology? How serious are we? How prudent are we? And if we spend money, we should spend it as wisely as possible. And if you are Supporting my honorable friend, only $260,000 to perform, to perform in the context of a nation of young people filled with hope and aspiration and a global economy, the sector of which is not $5 trillion, $4.5 trillion, how serious are we?
So these are growth-related issues that we are talking about. Now, the Prime Minister, with respect to talking about how the economy was performing, made reference to this BOSS boss initiative, this boss program. Now, I remember the mouth of the government touting very loudly, especially as it spoke from Christchurch East Central and St. Michael South Central. that this initiative on the part of the government was receiving extraordinary levels of support from public servants in Barbados who saw the opportunity to invest and get returns and invest at high interest rates, comparatively speaking, and get significant returns. And I remember hearing 95% of public servants are interested in these bonds and that we had a meeting with public servants and almost everybody in the room bar none was highly appreciative of this program and wanted to benefit from this scheme this BOSS boss program I questioned that then. It was scoffed at, as is the custom. We're still being told that the program is performing well. The program is performing well, perhaps because government is getting what it seeks to get, well, not all, but getting a measure, a fair measure of what it seeks to get in the first place from the program to go towards its capital works program, hopefully which would generate employment. Truth of the matter is, public servants have not seen this as attractive. Public servants in large numbers have not bought into this program. They've shunned this program. The majority of these bonds are now being bought or sold on the secondary market. People with money are benefiting from this, as I predicted, as was said by others. People with money who were not the intended targets, ostensibly, are benefiting from this. And that is what we are hearing. Prime Minister says it's about 4.5 million or so dollars per month over this 18 month program. We are now at 4.5, I think that's what the Honorable Prime Minister said. My research suggests it's, close, it's closer to 3.5. And that the majority of this goes, like I said, to persons in the secondary market who were not the intended target. And the public servants have been shunning this. Now, one can take the view that the government's goal, is being, government's goal is being served, but even that can be questioned, because I am pretty sure that in the initial stages, I heard that government had uh, anticipated maybe a take on this of up to eight million per month. There's somewhere around four million per month. So the 50% level performance. And a 50% level component is not going to the benefit of public servants who have shunned this largely. Because the circumstances don't allow them to get into this thing. People are scrambling from paycheck to paycheck, living, trying to make ends meet before COVID, and especially under COVID now and don't have that disposable income. So this program from the beginning would have only benefited those that are being benefited significantly. People with money already, 
making more money on the backs of the taxpayers of Barbados. 75% of it being taken up by the secondary market and not by the public servants of Barbados. What happens once we push past, and I say that prayerfully, once we push past COVID, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about the primarily, primary surplus dynamic that is in the mix of all of this thing. Government had agreed to a very harsh and austere position with the IMF of a 6% primary surplus over the length of the program. Had we had to pursue that, that would have been a stringency the likes of which none of us here had experienced. COVID has seen the avoidance of that. We've seen a reduction in the demanded, required, expected, sought for level of primary surplus, down to 1% now, below 1%. Question though, Mr. Speaker, is what happens once we have pushed past, gotten past, gone past COVID? It is my anticipation, and I stand to be corrected if there is one who can correct me, that the IMF will have Barbados revert to a higher level of austerity, stringency, when it comes to this business of the primary level surplus. And that once we get past COVID, it can be 1% or less than 1%. But we have to get back to this originally agreed to level of 6% at some stage, unless there's somebody who can show me a commitment on the part of the International Monetary Fund that that will not be the case then I think I should conclude that we have to go back there. And I say that because, Mr. Speaker, if we have to go back there, it has implications for the levels of expenditure that we can incur and in which we can engage. And that has implications for the program projected by the government today. The ease with which we are now acquainted in terms of the level of primary surplus demanded of us is not necessarily the experience or the reality of tomorrow. And therefore, that which we project must take cognizance of that. We are in a very dynamic world dynamic realities obtaining all around us. And we will have to revert to higher levels of primary surplus. I anticipate, while at the same time being constrained, obviously, in terms of our borrowing, and while at the same time having to repay much of which we have borrowed up until now. So when we talk about debt realities, and we talk about growth dynamics, growth realities, there's some major considerations that we have to take on board. It is our right to say that the government plans to do this. The government plans to do that. And we accept on face value that the government plans to do these things. But the reality is, what can you achieve given the constraints? And in terms of how you have allocated your immediate spending, have you taken cognizance 
of those realities and what they imply. We are yet, Mr. Speaker, for instance, to do restructuring at the level of several of the state-owned enterprises in Barbados, as far as I understand it. That is a serious requirement under the IMF program to which we are party. And COVID may have caused some pause on some things. And COVID may have caused that a fuller eye be cast on some matters as opposed to others. But as far as I understand, as far as I know, the National Mortgage Fund is still demanding of this country that we have serious restructure among our state-owned enterprises. And that is a job yet to be fully undertaken. And that has implications for how we go forward. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me say a word on the business of agriculture, and I really would hope my honorable friend from St. Philip South would be here because I don't want to say <coughs> anything which becomes a subject of hearsay for him. But I don't see him at this moment. But let me speak on agriculture. And this is speaker, public discussion, media debate by means of articles and editorials in Barbados relating to agriculture, in my view, should be focused on several very important things. How do we reduce our significantly high level of food import costs, food import bill, a $600, $700 million? A high. The debate in the public arena should be about that. The discussion in this parliament should be about that. import substitution policy and initiatives, reducing the costs, feeding ourselves, creating food security. In fact, beyond food security, beyond food security, in fact, food sovereignty. The debate should be about that. The debate should be in the society, in this parliament, in the media, about resuscitating agriculture to move us beyond the point of being a one-pillar economy. The evidence of our COVID experience suggests clearly, if we didn't know it before, that Barbados had become a one-legged economy, a one-pillar economy. We should be discussing in this parliament and in the public arena, and it should be the focus of the media articles and editorials. How do we resuscitate the agriculture sector and move us away from being a one-pillar economy? The discussion should be about the proper and transparent use of the old Clico estates in Barbados, particularly so rural Barbados. That's what we should be talking about, the old Clico estates. How do we get idle agricultural lands back into food production? Barbados is growing so much grass. That's not being used for anything. It's bush. And I understand the Honorable Member for Christchurch West when he says there are no idle lands in Barbados. But I also know that there are lands lying idle, growing bush, growing grass that used to grow food. 
We should be talking about that. The discussion should be about diversifying the sector such that we get into new forms of agribusiness that may be more appealing and more attractive to our young people and to a new cadre of that constitutes a new farming community, farming element, and developing businesses in such a way as that we can change the profile of the sector, making it better. That is what the discussion should be about in here, out there, in the media, both the traditional media and the social media. Discussion should be about adequate levels and availability of water for farming and for agricultural effort and enterprise in Barbados. Water scarcity, irrigation issues in the agricultural sector, that's what the discussion about should be about. Should be about the sale of agrochemicals and their use within the context of a strong and enforced regulatory framework. The safe use of agrochemicals and a supporting and strongly enforced regulatory framework around agriculture. The discussion should be about these things and other important things relative to agriculture. Mr. Speaker, though, instead, the debate in the public arena, traditional media, social media, the public square, is about how do you justify the need for two ministers of agriculture to manage $46 million, I think it is $47 million, while the Minister of Health is out while on his feet. No parliamentary secretary, no Minister of State. And these things fall to the discretion of the Prime Minister's head of cabinet. But I'm talking about what the discussion is about why two ministers of agriculture, while the Minister of Health battling the greatest stress that has ever faced this country by all mouths, is out on his feet. The discussion is about that in part. The discussion, rather than being about the incorporation of technology into the agricultural sector, is about the circumstances under which people are resigning. The circumstances under which people are being dismissed within the bowels of this ministry. Entities under the purview of this ministry. This is a subject of discussion. Who has resigned? Who has been dismissed? The reasons why? The circumstances around which? Now that's what we're talking about when it comes to agriculture in the midst of a public health threat which has shown to us that our economy is on a shaky one leg and that we need the business of agriculture to be properly restored. We are forced to talk about who resigned or who was fired. Why Mr. So resigned then? Why is Mr. S Mr. So being dismissed now? And this and the next.
The discussion ought to be about those very important things I mentioned earlier. Rather than that, the discussion is about why an individual is being paid by check $7,000. Is it justified? Should she be paid? How she got the job in the first place? Who is her benefactor? Who sent her for the job? Who authorized the check to be issued? Which member of the board personally wanted or did collect the check? Hey, this is what the discussion in agriculture right now is about in Barbados. Not about necessarily scaling up production. We may mention that once or twice. Not necessarily diversification, not necessarily new employment efforts, not necessarily building institutional capacity. No, it's about some lady that gets a check for $7,000 who was fired for whatever reason and who was entitled to $7,000 by somebody say so. And the question as to who picks up the check and who drops it off, that's Barbados in 2021 and the business of agriculture. The discussion is about how contracts within the Ministry of Agriculture are awarded. Now, one might say that this is true across several ministries. And we have talked about the cost to the public purse of these contracts. And I have not heard any statement yet to justify the level of money expended in relation to contracts in Barbados. I have heard feeble attempts to assert that we need the expertise to get the job done. But beyond that, I have not heard any serious, significant attempt to justify the number of consultants, the monies that are being paid to them. But I'm not dealing with that today in a broad and general sense. I'm dealing with the Ministry of Agriculture and the fact that the discussion today in this parliament, the discussion today in the public square the, public, the discussion today in the public media is about contracts and how they are awarded. And what was it that qualified a particular individual for the contract related to a factory job in which a man lost his life? Now, hey, hey, hey. Don't look at me as though this is news to you. This has been news making the wrongs in Barbados for a while. And the discussion in part has been about that. The discussion has been about that. How did certain people get specific contracts? What qualified him, them, for this factory job from which an individual fell tragically and met his death? These questions have been raised publicly. These questions have not been answered. These questions linger on. The discussion ought to be about the sublime elements related to the performance of the agriculture ministry and not to these issues. Mr. Speaker, the discussion now is about the burial site of skeletons, whose skeletons they are and where they are to be found buried. That's the debate in agriculture in Barbados today. The burial site of skeletons. I want to hear 
voices out of the Ministry of Agriculture, out of the BADMC, telling me positive, wholesome, progressive things. Not telling me, I know where the skeletons are buried. And if I start to speak, heads can, people can hold their heads and ball. That is where we are, unfortunately. The discussion ought to be, are we really producing more in terms of agricultural output in Barbados? Are we really producing more? Or is it that we are better accounting for that which we are producing? These are some of the questions that are out there and uh, which constitute public discussion. Now, the Minister of Agriculture, my honorable colleague from St. Philip South, is quoted in recent public statements speaking on the matter of the BADMC. And I found the comments to be interesting. I found the comments to be disappointing as well because of the realities upon which they reflected. Minister is quoted as saying, as far as BADMC is concerned, the entity has not been sufficiently responsive to the needs of the country. Now, the minister is saying that after three years heading the ministry. The minister is saying that, and if the minister is not saying that, he will tell the public and he will tell this house that he's not saying that. But I'm talking about public discussion in the media, in the public square. And in the media, the minister is reported as saying, with respect to the BADMC, that the entity is not sufficiently responsive, Mr. Speaker, to the needs of the country after three years. This is a discovery after three years. It is a discovery which comes about after public turbulence around this entity. It is a discussion which comes about after three years. The minister is quoted further, reported further, Mr. Speaker, as saying, we have just discovered. I don't remember you quoting from a, a, a speech. I, or, I, am or not, I am not quoting. I am talking about what is the subject of public debate, Mr. Speaker. You're not quoting from any newspaper. I am not quoting article. from any newspaper. I am not quoting from any newspaper. You are not reading from any newspaper. It's not I am not reading from, from any, any article. I am not reading from any article. So then this is um, conjecture or? This is not conjecture. This is, in fact, public debate. But well, it's not reported speech at all? I it, don't this is not reported speech. This is public debate. These are sentiments being expressed in the public square and in the media space. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. <coughs> And I'm doing so reluctantly because I really don't want to give oxygen to that which is. The Honourable Member is misleading the House, Mr. Speaker. He says to the House and the people of Barbados that the Minister is quoted as saying, when you ask him, he said he's not reading quotations. So he's standing on the floor of Parliament and accusing me of saying things that he cannot produce proof for. And I beg, Mr. Speaker, that the comments be withdrawn. I remember um, if when you are uh, contributing to the debate, you, you have the, the floor of the House to refute those 
any allegations and or quotes and or misquotes as that are uttered by the honorable leader of the opposition. You'll be given that you have that privilege to, to so do. Because he, he has not quoted, he, he said he said that he is he said that he is not reading from any excerpt from any newspaper or from any article. Thank you, sir. And as I was saying, not sufficiently responsive to the needs of the country, a discovery after three years heading the ministry. We've just discovered the inadequate, the, inadequ the inadequacy of the capacity for storage existing at BADMC. The, the inability to store for farmers, part of the function of the entity, is to create storage for excess production coming from farmers, I gather. Well, after three years, we find that it is discovered that that capacity is inadequate. And it is discovered only in the context of the need to store, or, or, or it, is only, it, is, it is discovered only in the context of the need to facilitate the care package distribution program. After three years, I am to conclude that were there not a care package program, that discovery itself may not have been made even at this point. Because nothing previously had led to the discovery that there was incapacity with respect to storage or lack of capacity with respect to storage. With respect to the entity, the BADMC, there has been a lack of traction in developing the marketing arm of BADMC. There has been a lack of traction in developing the marketing arm of BADMC. My goodness. After three years, and after how many months? Four months? Two ministers? We have now discovered there's a lack of traction in developing the marketing arm of the BADMC, which I presume is a priority function with respect to helping with the distribution of agricultural produce. We've now discovered as well after three years, Mr. Speaker, no alacrity shown with respect to developing the feed program. Now, I, I'm shocked to hear that one because we've boasted about this feed program, this F-E-E-D, this empowerment program for young farmers. But the entity, be it the MC, has shown no alacrity in developing the feed program. So we're not where we ought to be with the feed program. The feed program has been negatively, negatively effect, affected because of the performance of the BADMC and the marketing arm does not function viably and there's inadequate storage capacity and the entity is not sufficiently responsive to the needs of the country. But as BADMC, and that is part of the discussion taking place, I take it even the urban Minister has now gone into and become a part of the public discussion himself. I take it. But such is the reality. When we should be talking about these other more sublime things, we are dealing with these negatives and with some of the ridiculous goings on at the entity 
and in the ministry. Now, Mr. Speaker, government in the throne speech last talked about the sugar industry as well with respect to restructuring to enable public private sector partnered participation. Sugar industry in Barbados. Now, depending on who you're talking to, you will hear differing opinions as to the viability of sugar industry itself or anything that has to do with the growth, cultivation of sugar. But the government in the throne speech talked about formulating public-private partnership arrangements around pursuit of certain elements of the sugar industry in Barbados. The plan to allow for share investment by farmers and farmers groups, sugar workers, private investors in the industry. I didn't hear the Honorable Prime Minister mention that at all today. I haven't heard mention of it for a while. Maybe when the Honorable Minister does speak, he will in part um, seek to address that. He will perhaps seek to address that when he does speak. But really, I don't know that there will be many people in Barbados who will go to credit union or bank if they must needs do so, get money to invest in the sugar industry as we know it, as a spouse, as alluded to in that throne speech. But I invite comment further on the matter from the minister if he so um, designs to do. Now, the matter of the <laughs> marijuana industry in Barbados also engages the energies of the Ministry of Agriculture. Prime Minister sought to set it in a proper context and against relevant backdrop underscoring perhaps the need to place an emphasis about a relationship with Canadian entities, transactions through Canadian banks as opposed to US because of certain federal law requirements or prohibitions. Those things are understood. But the truth of the matter is, I still think Barbados need to be persuaded that they are going to be operating on anything other than the periphery of this industry. Now, I said in here, last time I got the opportunity to speak, my understanding was that there were two licenses approved um, with reference to the, medic the marijuana industry, cannabis industry in Barbados, and the Honorable Minister would have corrected that somewhat, sought to bring some clarity to that. He did say that no licenses have been issued. My concern then was, and still is, because we were talking corruption then, that is if people are given upfront information as to pending government policy, as to the establishment of institutions and the implementation of policy legislated through this chamber, if they're given upfront information on that, that puts them at an advantage over others, and that that advantage is derived by that knowledge because of political connections or familial connections or friendship connections, any association of that sort, then 
that is a form of corruption. That was the issue then. And that is why I made reference to that. The minister sought to clarify, and I have to tell you, in the interest of full disclosure, that in private he said to me, licenses have not been issued. But the chief executive officer said, I think that's where the designation is, was that applications had been approved. The point stands that if applications have been approved, because people were able to get ahead in the queue, because of prior knowledge, then that is something over which I have some concern. Honorable, Honorable Mr. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the Honorable Member is misleading the House. Oh. Um, <coughs> I have said before, and I will repeat, there's an application process. And I know the Honorable Member long enough to know that he knows the difference between process and approval. Uh, people have applied for licenses because the medicinal cannabis industry was launched on the 18th of January. It has attracted several applications of various types, majority of which are Barbadians. No application has been approved of the, of the applications that were received. 98% of them is, are still in what you call draft, meaning that they have been read, people are asking for information, they want to know where is the next step, those kind of things. Two applications have been received in full, none have been approved. All right, well, thank you for that clarification again, um, Mr. Speaker. I thought I heard the CEO said two licenses have been approved. I thought in private conversation, the minister said um, no licenses have been issued, but two applications have been approved. If I am incorrect in thinking I have heard that, I apologize. Yes, I do. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. So we're talking about the marijuana industry that falls under the purview of the Ministry of Agriculture. The fear is, my persuasion is, that we are going to have significant levels of foreign dominance in terms of investment and in terms of benefit in this industry. There is a significant level of disappointment obtaining out in the Barbadian community among those who have, for various reasons, an interest in a marijuana industry in Barbados with certain aspects of it are becoming legitimate activity. We know of the Canadian interests that already exist that's been demonstrated with reference to parts of Central America and other parts of the Caribbean. We expect that that will also obtain here. I'm simply saying that once again, just as we did perhaps with sugar, we will see a situation where Barbadians are drawers of water and hewers of wood with respect to this industry and have to operate on the periphery of the industry. It will be foreign dominated in terms of investments and therefore its benefits. And the chances are that much of that foreign re uh, generated foreign revenue will not end up at the disposal of the Barbados economy. Now, you can dismiss that and say that that doesn't matter. But the thing is, we are shifting, have shifted from sugar. The thing is that there has been nothing significantly of interest that have excited people in the agricultural sector, perhaps to the extent that this new venture has. And I am warning against the pushback 
gendered by the measure of disappointment which will be experienced when this, this sector does not deliver for this country what we anticipate that it will, and when that it leaves Barbadians again on the periphery of what we call a new sector. But I have troubled the spirit of the Minister of Agriculture enough for one day, and I will leave the rest for another occasion when at your leave I may proceed further, Mr. Speaker. Now, labor, social partnership, relations. <coughs> labor and social partnership relations. I still cannot believe, and I am sure that you are as dumbfounded as I am, Mr. Speaker, that a Minister of Labor will come to this Honorable House to debate the estimates and not know what the unemployment rate is. That is mystifying. That is mystifying. Don't tell me the statistical department does this analysis and keeps these records. Don't tell me other entities in government are much closer to this information than you are. If you are a minister of labor and the honorable member of St. James Central shows by his agreement with me that he understands what I'm saying. Sir, on a point of order, <coughs> sir, the yes, honourable sir. member must not do those things. I have said nothing in this house. So you cannot, therefore, I, I, therefore I cannot have shown any agreement of so anything. You cannot speak on your behalf. No, sir, he you must not. He knows behalf. better, sir. Point taken. He's looking for friends. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not speaking on the honourable member's behalf. I'm speaking on my own behalf. I'm simply saying I can see clear signs of his agreement with me. And that's all I'm saying. And I can. And were he Minister of Labor, he, the other members in James Central, would never come to this house. He may come and not know, but he would never say to anybody here in public hearing, I don't know. Because you have to prepare for where you come. And you can't come in a situation of high unemployment in Barbados when there has been this express, clearly expressed uncertainty on this issue, when questions have come and ranged from far and wide on the matter. You have a government central bank speaking to elevated levels. We have people speaking with reference to the number of claims on the NIS. But Barbadians are accustomed to being told that the unemployment rate is X percent or Y percent. But the Honorable Minister of Labor came here and told us he didn't know. I, I only mention that, Mr. Speaker, because I'm struggling to get past it. And I can't. <laughs> when you come here, Mr. Speaker, you can't say I don't know things like that. And then you later say to us, I have received information. These informations are compiled by the statistical, statistical department and the unemployment rate 13%. Now look, now the other minister was not making that statement. Your minister was saying this is the information that's come to me. So I am saying that I don't believe that information. I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that there are many people in Barbados who believe that the unemployment rate is 13%. If you tell me that the unemployment rate in Barbados is less now than it was at the height of economic failure or economic malperformance under the Sandiford, the Erskine Sandiford administration in the 1990s, 
then I'm astounded. If you tell me the unemployment rate now is lower than it was during that period, when you say to me that we're facing the worst experience that we have seen ever in our history, that the world is now facing an experience, the world upon which we depend, upon which our economy depends, is now facing an experience worse than anything since the 1940s war. You're telling me, with the total shutdown, with the total shutdown of the tourism sector, you're telling me that we have a better unemployment rate than we did in the 1990s. 13%. I have to see how that was arrived at. I have to see how we're doing the counting. You know, we can put people back to work for two days and three days and, and count them among the employed. Well, I suppose the employed. But you do that, you don't tell the full and true story. You can take people out of that group of people, that community of people who are actually actively seeking, who have, who have stopped actively seeking employment. So they're registering as not seeking any employment. Or we can put them into all kinds of established groupings. You know, just to name one, and I'm not suggesting anything negative about the Youth Advanced Corps, or whether it's a Sea Cadets um, program. But you can put people in various programs, and by that means take them out of the labor market numbers. They do, these are techniques that people use. The bottom line is, Mr. Speaker, you will have to convince me with 40,000 plus people losing their jobs, especially in one sector or related to one sector in the last seven months. You have to tell me that the unemployment rate is, is down to 13%. I can be persuaded, but you have to make the effort. I can be persuaded, but I warn you, you're likely to fail. 13% does not shout of accuracy. It has to be a fuller story to be told with respect to that number. Now, there are some pillars upon which this ministry sector is established. Part of the goal is to create opportunities for employment. That's right, create opportunities for employment or facilitate the creation of opportunities for employment. The problem I have with that, Mr. Speaker, is that we are satisfied in these days to create the kind of situations that produce underemployment. I continue to harp on this. Underemployment is a great scourge in Barbados. It's not this government's doing. It is not the doings of the government that preceded this one. It is historically the orientation of our economy that has thrown up jobs which conduce to what I call underemployment. People working in situations where they are not gainfully employed, not just employed, but gainfully employed. You go to work and you're working for far less than you deserve. You're working for less that enables you to have comfortable living. And we've got to do something about breaking, ending the scourge of unemployment is fine. 
to say that we will enter into capital projects. It is fine to say that we will generate the kind of work activity through various ministries that will see people go back to work. But the thing is, in Barbados, tremendous level of underemployment, and especially among women. And something has got to be done strategically and meaningfully to change that, this business of underemployment. It may be that even some members of this chamber would suggest that they are underemployed because they're not well paid. And they will have to make a case for that. But I know the reality out there in Barbados, where poor people live, is that underemployment is an evil, a scourge that has to be remedied. John, just take up a man and put him in a job. He earns a pittance so that you can say where he's working. Truth is, you helped him because he's working. But you've put him into the kind of a syndrome, kind of a context in which his level of poverty is perpetuating that of his dependence. And that is part of the story of generational poverty in Barbados. Because we don't seek sufficiently to break the cycle of poverty. We treat to respond sometimes to poor people by giving them handouts or a helping hand up. But we don't treat to break the cycle of poverty among poor people in Barbados. It's not enough to create employment opportunity. The goal must be to create meaningful employment chances. The failure to diversify our economy is part of what frustrates and stymies that effort to create meaningful job opportunity in Barbados. So we have a lot of people working in tourism. And a lot of them gone home now because of tourism shut down, can't make ends meet because the earnings derived in tourism to start with were not sufficient. So you live from paycheck to paycheck. And worse than that, you juggle debts, you juggle expenses. And once that small pittance keeps coming, you have perfected the art of juggling expenses that one of these days, that stops, that flow stops. You can't juggle anymore. And you're faced with a nightmare of poverty from which you have never escaped. And I know that there's some in this house who believe that our business is not simply to find any job for somebody. There are some of us in this house who believe that we have got to change the material position of people in the world by changing their circumstances of poverty. The work of the Poverty Alleviation Bureau helped with that. The work of the Urban Development Commission. The work of the Rural Development Commission some other entities of government at some point. Have you seen a halt to a lot of this over the past 12, 13 years? I know a lot of people in St. Michael West whose living circumstances today are drastically different because they were able to own their property through the help of the Urban Tenantries Program. The Urban Housing Program led significantly by this now administration in a former lifetime. But those programs seem, seem to have halted. And the point I am making, Mr. Speaker, is that we've got just not to stand up and boast about getting people back to work. I mean, when you're desperate, I suppose you will do any desperate thing, but you can't simply boast about getting people back to work. We've got to break the cycle of poverty and put people into meaningful employment. It cannot be 
a certain elements live a certain quality of life in Barbados with an, an indifference to the quality of life others are forced to live. And the privilege might feel comfortable, but the government elected in majority numbers, in total majority numbers, by the people of Barbados cannot suffice itself by creating space for any job and be satisfied with that. That must be a stepping stone to something better. And that is what I'm talking about. Part of the philosophical pillar, the goals of this ministry is outlined as enhancing the labor supply in Barbados. And I just want to meet, to, to repeat that I am of the view that we need to do a better job in matching the produced labor skills in Barbados with the labor market demands and the goals of a national development agenda. At the tertiary level, that is an obvious problem. Tertiary level invested education that throws out all kinds of people whose qualifications and achievements do not necessarily relate to the demands of the labor market here and whose skills and qualifications do not coincide with the interests of the national development goals. To me, part of the synergy that should be shaped between the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Education lies just here in trying to ensure that we produce the kind of skills in labor, the kind of, kind of qualifications in the labor force that are in consonance with the National Development Goals and in consonance with the demands of the labor market. Too often, we find frivolous applications appearing in the media. This entity wants this skill, and it has to be found and located abroad because it can't be found and located here in Barbados. Many times, that's not the case. But unfortunately, sometimes, in some instances, it is the case. And all I'm saying is there must be a greater, if we're going to invest this much in education, must be a greater synergy, a greater correlation between what we produce for the labor market and what the labor market demands and what we produce and who we qualify in terms of what the national development agenda goals suggested to us. If not, we're wasting many dollars in the very important area of education. I have said repeatedly, and I will keep on saying so, that we wisely invest in education in Barbados, but we do not necessarily invest wisely in education in Barbados. Part of the philosophical platform upon which this ministry is premised, according to its documents, is to promote entrepreneurship. And therefore, I will continue to ask the question as to whether or not we do our best to provide those fiscal incentives that facilitate or promote entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a good word, a grand word. The impulse that is implied is a noble impulse. The goals pursued by such efforts are laudable goals. But it takes more than that. We have to provide a platform. We, we provide all kinds of incentives. <laughs> Tourism sector, boom. Foreign investment coming to Barbados, boom, incentives, concessions. The best we seem to think we can do is to provide a little small grant for a few fellows out of the country or from a wrong tongue 
to do a little thing that will bring them a few dollars that hopefully we keep body and soul and spirit together. And I don't know that that is the best that we can do. And this government, I know we boast about what we've done with respect to tax in the corporate arena in Barbados and all of that. But truth be told, the taxation dynamic is counterproductive to the whole notion of facilitating small level, medium sized level entrepreneurship in Barbados. Because tax policy places imposts on a lot of raw materials, on other inputs, on serious costs of services and supplies such that small entrepreneurs are battling the boisterous winds and waves of turbulent currents and they don't survive there they go under there after a while and I believe it is part of the responsibility of this ministry to make sure that this is improved the business of the work relations climate in Barbados and I, I know the ministers come close to agreement with me that things are not nice with respect to work relations in Barbados. So I, I invite him to be further forthcoming with that which he says and make strong pronouncements because the truth is there's too much an instance within which it can be clearly seen that Capital is trying to unfair, already disadvantaged labor in Barbados. So we can't hem and haw. We can't talk around it. We can't whisper it in silky tones. We've got to call a spade a spade. We've got to do it because this means that poor black boys, that community out of which we came, are being made to suffer at the hands of the selfish, sometimes the unscrupulous and uncaring elements in the private capital world of Barbados. Now, there's this issue of the minimum wage. As the Alman member St. George North rightly characterized it, we need a living wage, a livable wage. People need to have something upon which they can lodge their lives, even though there is not suggested there is a 100% improvement in the level of comfort attaching to their situation. That improvement needs to be significant the proposing an, a minimum wage that will bring us in now at about $300 plus a week. $300 plus a week, $1,300 plus per month. And the um, question is that a living wage. Though a man is able to buy a few more biscuits and a couple more bars of soap or bottles of drink, is he in fact put in a position where he is now able to live by that which we are proposing? Again, bearing in mind the costs imposed on his living experience by government, taxes, and other contributions. Now, I support implementation of a, a minimum wage. I called for that even before I heard the government pronounce it. But it should be a wage that is livable and it should be a wage that is meaningful. And always the first response of private capital is that it will carry up the cost of business. Now I heard the Honorable Prime Minister in here today very clearly with my two ears promise 
and warned the business elements in this country that this notion, this notion of responding to this type of initiative in a way that suggests that you should lay off people and to talk about the cost of business going up and all of that is not something that the government will countenance. And I hope that that is more than just rhetoric. I hope that's more than just rhetoric. And I hope for vibrancy among the organized labor community. And I hope for vigilance and diligence on the part of government that when this wage is introduced, that the reactionary element within the private sector world in Barbados will not be allowed to get away with any foolish strictures that reverses the goals and policy of the government and sets some in the labor sector in Barbados back. I mention again issues of unionization and I invite the other member again to be full-throated and clear voice on this matter of unionization and say that we are standing for this foolishness and our businesses who would defy the best efforts of, or, of organized labor to have a good social partnership relationship within which the interests of labor are also recognized, protected, and pursued, that the minister with clear voice, full-throated expression, will say, not boat here, not boat here. Not so long as I am Minister of Labor are we going to stand for that. Because business people believe that in the context of high unemployment, they can do that. That's what I call capital dominance. Capital dominance gone wild among certain elements of private sector capital in Barbados. And in Ministry of Labor, apart from organized labor, the Ministry of Labor is the people's first champion of defense in so far as this is concerned, albeit government itself is an employer, an employer of some significance. Please treat to the institutional capacity of the unemployment, the employment, the, the employment right tribunal. I heard the lamentations with respect to it, the capacity that is available to it, the resources that are, are available to it. I know of the issues around the, the, the legal, the, the wrangling over uh, legally related issues where matters of discipline then fell subject to the interference or interjection or intervention of practitioners of the law and how disadvantaged this would have been for some small businesses and stuff. These things should be properly and fully treated too, not for an instance, but for all time. The matters of changes relative to contracts to be renewed. These are issues which are important, cannot be left to linger because labor suffers immensely and sometimes business too. And these matters have to be dealt with and dealt with forcefully and dealt with well and dealt with in the context of a proper regulatory frame. Now, Mr. Speaker, I need to speak a little bit about tourism. I, I promise you I'm not going to cover every ministry um, that's captured in these estimates. Um, Prime Minister did a sufficient job on that. But some of them I have to make. Tourism is one, and the voice of the Honorable Minister is not to be heard in this chamber, but I'm sure that she may very well have an echo that might be heard fairly loudly here. There is this best program, you know, this Barbados Labour Party government likes to deal with the B's, the acronym, the BOSS, the BERT, and the BESS, and the, and the,
But there's this best program, which has to be returned to the drawing board. Has to be returned to the drawing board. This, this, sorry? This B, well, that too. This B E S T program has to be returned to the drawing board. Now, when I said in here that the hotel sector would not necessarily find this attractive and that the government was not finding the support for it from the hotel sector, that they anticipated again, I was rebutted this time by the other member of St. Michael South Central. Now we're hearing government itself admitting that. This one will go back to the drawing board. $300 million allocated on the best program, the lion's share of which goes to the hotel sector to allow essentially for capital works and some energy refurbishments, et cetera, to make plant more attractive. On condition, of course, that you employ at least for two or three days some of the staff which are normally on your register. And that, that staff will be working for 80% of their normal pay. I think that's the rudiments of the program. Two to three days per week employment with 80% pay. And about what, 40,000 people around in the, in the that's 40 or 14,000 people around in the hotel sector. And a program anticipated to have a lifespan of about 24 months, two years. We take the overall sum of 300,000 and you divide it among the number of workers. Even if you, even if you say 10, if it's 40,000, you say 10,000. And you divide it among 10,000 people. My calculations bring me to about 3 or 12, $1,200, $1,200 per person. $1,200 per person. That is about what you're proposing for the minimum wage, just under, in fact. So it's not significant. And then you have the added disadvantage that these people actually lose their work under this particular arrangement where they're being paid at 80% of their normal pay. Then they have problems with the national insurance because their benefits are calculated on this level of pay, unless I'm mistaken. So this is a program that the, the, the workers, I'm glad, I'm sure will be glad for the work, but fought through to the end is not necessarily so reassuring. But then I say, well, you're desperate, you're desperate. And if you're out of work, the best you can do then is this. If that's it, then that's it. And then the hotel workers, of course, you enter into this. Government sees this as an investment of shares in this. And therefore, when things return to better for the hotel sector, then those shares must be redeemed. Therefore, the hotel sector not too keen on this. And hence, the best program has to be returned to the drawing board. And it should have been returned to the drawing board far sooner than now. But there are those who, in their stubborn view, who feel that they are purveyors of all knowledge, and who understand the culture of the Barbadian economy better than anybody else. They figure that this is all right. Well, now you're hearing that it is not so all right. Mr. Speaker, I, I cannot talk about tourism without talking about, if you're still with me, Mr. Speaker, about LIAC. About LIAC. Now, you know, when it comes to the COVID thing, Mr. Speaker, I start from this premise that the first consideration is life and the preservation of life. Economic considerations fall second place behind my consideration about life, well-being, preservation of life. Now, when it comes to this layout thing, Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding the complexities of the issue, here's where I start, that we're talking about Barbadian workers. 
We're talking about Barbadians. I start there with that. Notwithstanding anything that the Prime Minister of Antigua has to say, notwithstanding any new arrangements on the administration for Liat, notwithstanding matters of uh, relative to the prudence or imprudence of, of, of um, liquidating Liat, all those are important, but for me, you know, Mr. Speaker, the first consideration is for me that these people, the pilots and other people who have been employed by Liat are Barbadians first of all. And my question of the government of Barbados is a clear please statement as to what is being done in the interests of the Barbadian Liat employed workers. It's almost a year now, next month, early, will be a year when several of these people, I think about a hundred of them, Barbadian employees of Lea, company based in Antigua, Mr. Speaker, will be out of work and suffering, living paycheck to paycheck, many of them, as my investigations have suggested to me. These are Barbadians, Mr. Speaker. These are not Taiwanese. These are not Brazilians. These are Barbadians. And for a whole long year, for a whole long year, in my view, through no fault of their own, they are left to suffer both the indignity and the hardships associated with their now plight of being unemployed and unpaid or uncompensated for labors of past. Living paycheck to paycheck. My understanding is that these people were given, Mr. Speaker, a one-off payment of $2,400 in August of 2020. $2,400 in August of 2020. That brings us to what is it, about eight months now since then. $300 per month for the last eight months. That is less than the minimum wage that you're proposing. $300 per month for the last eight months. You think you can live on that, Mr. Speaker? I suspect not. $300, a one-off compassionate payment, $300 for the last eight months. Now, a few of them have had NIS responses to their plight, but the majority of them, and there are a hundred of them, have not because, Mr. Speaker, by arrangements made prior to their service, arrangements between the partnering governments in Liat as an enterprise, a regional enterprise, though an Antiguan company, company registered in Antigua. Arrangements made before they would, have start, they would have started their tenure, their service. The NIS had to be paid in Antigua and not in Barbados. Therefore, the complexities of the situation, a limited liability company in Antigua registered their national insurance paid in Antigua as opposed to pay, being paid in Barbados, puts them at a serious disadvantage, which has brought about serious hardship and stress. Now, that is the reality with respect to the NIS. I start with the reality that these people are Barbadians and that something more must be done, should have been done, should evidently have been done, should apparently and obviously be done in their interests. We don't have to shout across the Caribbean at one another to make sure that we speak with loud voice and that our message is understood. We don't have to have a shouting match across the Caribbean to make sure that our voices are heard in other jurisdictions concerning our interests on behalf of our Barbadian people. Now, 
if an arrangement unfortunately has been generated by an understanding among governments who operated this entity, then a secondary, second reason is constituted as to why Barbados should be strong and loud in what it is saying in the interest of these layout workers. And not only strong and loud in what it is saying, but also obvious and evident in what it is doing on behalf of these Barbadian workers. As I understand it further, the company right now is protected from lawsuits because of the administrative measures around the whole business of Leia as existed then. So you can't take anybody to any civil court to get action. You gotta wait, and you're at the mercy of a government in Antigua. You're at the mercy of a government in Barbados. And you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And you suffer in quiet as a group of a hundred Barbadians who should know a better experience. If the government cares, the government needs to shout more loudly. The government needs to be more proactive in what it is doing to redress the situation and ensuring that these people are helped. Consider and imagine, Mr. Speaker, if you're out of work for a year, your exposure to creditors. Consider that. Consider that. Consider that. Based on your expected income, you would have established certain credit debt arrangements around your life and that of your family, but you're now exposed to creditors. Some of these people, Mr. Speaker, I am made to realize are having to depend upon the generosity and charity of people to provide even some of the more basic necessities for life. This is a story that we can't close our eyes, minds, or shut our ears to. This is something that the government should be heard on. Antigua has been speaking loudly in defiance of the rest of the Caribbean on this matter. I don't know if Barbados has been speaking quietly, but its voice needs, in my view, to be heard. Its hands need to be felt. Its actions need to be evident, apparent, obvious that something is being done to address these people's plight. Their mortgages to be serviced. People have lost their homes already, um, Mr. Speaker. People are now falling victim to the arduous and diligent efforts of collection agencies. This is a bad business, a bad business. I start from the point of view that they are Barbadians. And if they are Barbadians, then the government of Barbados should be more robust in my view as to what it does to address their situation. Barbados, Mr. Speaker, must promote a model of tourism. And yes, we talk about diversi diversification totally necessary. We say Barbados can't depend upon tourism. I think the fuller truth is that you can't depend upon tourism only. And that the very tourism industry has to be diversified. That sun and sea and sand and sex model is outdated. At least the sun part and the sea part and the sand part. But our model is outdated, Mr. Speaker, and we have got to diversify. And there's so many different areas. Prime Minister in passing just mentioned the matter of medicinal, medical tourism. And I think that that is a huge area for exploitation. That very sun. 
huge area for exploitation. Our location, our climate, the whole atmosphere that pervades over this island. We are a well-disposed people. We live a civilized tone of life. We offer peace and tranquility to the world, a place within which it is easy to rest and relax and recreate. And therefore, medicinal tourism has potential to bring us significant benefits, the presence of the <laughs> Ross Medical School. Uh, I don't know, that may be seen as education tourism. Some may say it's medical tourism, but that is but one entity. And we don't have to go and, by whatever means, deprive Dominica of what it has. The market is big, medical tourism, and there are benefits in terms of health equity to be realized and expanded medical facilities here serving, especially private sector facilities, serving the tourist element. Tremendous benefits. There are complementarities to be derived between the public service and private sector facilities set up for medical tourism. The realities of what they call it, telemedicine these days, again, adds to the potential for developing this field of medical tourism. Of course, we'd have to guard against some of the inequities which could be introduced as a result of the presence of private facilities catering to visitors to our shores. But I believe the advantages will far outweigh the disadvantages, especially if properly managed. And that, that is an area that we should seek carefully to develop heritage tourism this coastal experience that we seek to offer people again, sun, sea, sand, <clears throat> this coastal experience, this whole development of a coastal tourism architecture is, is, is all right, but we got to look at other aspects of our heritage and our culture. I even hear voices now being raised and significantly so, a brilliant voice that speaks in the, in the other house on these matters even tourism potential relating to our slave history and, and our, our um, heritage and traditions with respect to that, um, Mr. Speaker. Links with reference to education, the, the Ross School is, is only one, but there's more than medical school out there. I've said many times before, forensics is a significant area being uh, developed by institutions, particularly so in North America, arts and culture. I had some meetings with uh, some arts and culture related entities that came here out of, the United, out of the United States and the kinds of things that they're saying could be offered in partnership with uh, creative elements, cultural elements here and cultural institutions here in Barbados are amazing. It is to be aware of them. It is to explore them. It is to recognize the benefits that the country can derived from expanding in our area of tourism. The old business of renewables that we're looking for, tourism sector can be a big component part of attracting the technologies associated with the renewable energy efforts. And sure, the Minister of, of, of Energy is quite alert to these possibilities. And agriculture, you know, marijuana, fine. But there's so many other things that can be used um, to serve the needs of you travel the world and people use all kinds of things uh, agricultural product we, we 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 sell coconuts here we drink the water a few of us eat the jelly some people got the food on the inside and the shells are thrown away and all of that we husk coconuts and we bake using the inside for bread and, and we throw away the rest of, i've seen these products used in certain places made all kinds of things all kinds of local things people use to, to produce all kinds of products. 
and they sell to the world because the world is crazy about these trinkets and, and um, condiments and souvenirs that are locally produced in tourist destinations that they visit around the world. That's sports. I keep saying we make sport about sports. But it's all tourism, <laughs> sports industry in the world. My goodness. So many wealthy sporting entities. We have this strong historical connection with the UK, other parts of Europe as well. You have so many major wealthy football clubs that look for some space every year on the season break to go to recreate themselves or to do break training. And, and Barbados has a tremendous climate capacity facilities. And all we need to do is make sure we build the kind of arena. And if you want to be engaged in capital projects, here's one. Build a sufficiently adequate and viable, viably functioning sporting arena that can serve for the training needs of football clubs coming out of it. We've had a few of them coming here, <laughs> running around on Kensington for a day or two, beat by this 10 or 12 love. And we're satisfied to see that white fellas running about behind the ball, beating black people to have love, but they came and spent a few dollars, even more than that. And that's an architecture, that's a capital infrastructure that can be, can be built out because it will generate foreign exchange. It will generate employment. It will bring people to Barbados who will not only recreate and hone their skills further in training, but they will spend they will speak the word of Barbados. They will cause others to come. They will bring their families. And all I am saying is when it comes to tourism, when we say it's a, the one leg upon which our economy substantially stands, we need to move away from that. We're not saying get away, get away from tourism. We're saying that di diversify tourism, make it a bigger and better project, better sector so the country can very much and better benefit. Now, when it comes to international business, Mr. Speaker, I ask the question, what are we doing to make sure that we return, if not all the way, significantly to the levels of revenue generation derived from this sector before? We know that Canadian laws have been changed, arrangements with Caribbean jurisdictions in this context have been changed. Competition has arisen in other quarters, and therefore we've seen an erosion of this sector in the Barbados economy, a sector which has substantially helped to build the middle-class experience that many people now live in Barbados, a sector which has enabled us to develop a lot of the in infrastructural capacity which we now have and which we now enjoy. But over time, this has been reduced, and significantly so. And the estimates, I don't think clearly. I know the minister did an admirable job in putting forth his projections and positing his goals, and the ministry support team did. But I was still to, I was still want to hear a more fulsome um, presentation, submission, uh, pos positing of what the ministry intends to do to help us to get back anywhere near where we same thing to do with manufacturing. A lot of people think that manufacturing is, is gone, and um, to a large extent it is, but we, we still have the capacity to revive this sector, and we need to give greater focus to so doing. And I like the idea of a free trade zone, um, a free zone. Um, I mooted it myself here. If I, I've had discussion with one particular um, foreign entity present here with respect to the possibility of setting up this type of activity for foreign investment in Barbados. will especially benefit manufacturing and will generate foreign exchange and will help with our export um, levels and will help with respect to pricing competitiveness uh, and I support that but we've got to do that and more because manufacturing can play a critical role in helping Barbados 
out of the hole in which now it finds itself and getting back at least to that plateau where upon what which we swear upon which what we stood um, especially with respect to manufacturing i hear of the efforts to have a diplomatic presence in africa certain un centers in africa and stuff like that i hear about the plan to have um, diplomatic centers representing our trade and investment interests, places like Kenya and Ghana, United Arab Emirates. I am not decrying those efforts. I am not saying we shouldn't look to Kenya. We shouldn't look to, to Ghana. I'm certainly not saying we shouldn't look to United Arab Emirates. But what I am saying is that in addition to that, and perhaps even a greater priority, perhaps some might suggest should be attached to the potential for developing trade and investment links with certain centers in Central America, wider Latin America region, and certainly with Asia, and not only to have a diplomatic presence in, in Beijing that serves a number of the Asian-centered economic communities, many of whom are becoming economic giants in today's world. And as this shift, <laughs> As a shift in economic primacy continues to develop vis-a-vis -vis relations between the West and the East, especially Asian centers, Barbados might tend to find that its interests are better served, or at least well served, in developing trade and investment links with Asian community, especially with respect, again, to manufacturing, uh, to technology, and even to some of the renewable um, energies. I support the effort to incorporate efforts of the diasporic community in what we do with respect to trade and investment in venture capital initiatives. I've long said it can't be sufficient that we see the diaspora only as a community among which we can look for some political support that is in the UK or in certain parts of North America, that we see the diaspora only in terms of their point of return to Barbados and we facilitate the coming with their personal effects being um, not, not being charged duties and that we see them as setting up a middle class living um, experience in St. Philip or certain parts of St. James, but that we see the diaspora community as a substantial Barbadian community on ground in strong economic centers through which we can work to impact those economic centers. Jamaicans do it substantially. Ghanaians do it somewhat significantly. Trinidadians do it. And um, I don't think Barbados does it enough. I'm glad to hear moving in that direction. I strongly believe that we need a stronger, um, more visible, more potent, more respected institutional, institutional entity revolving around the effort of the diaspora. I don't know how you would do that with all these ministries that we have now. Certainly one would not want perhaps to counter the notion of a ministry of diaspora affairs. Maybe one that attaches the, an apartment a department in the Ministry of, of Trade, but wh however you go about it, here is a tremendous vehicle of potential for attracting Barbadian investment, foreign investment to Barbados, marketing Barbadian products abroad, building the image of Barbados in overseas communities, earning foreign exchange for Barbados, and identifying with Barbados in real terms that go beyond a birth or citizenship identity. I think that that is extremely important. Now my honorable friend from St. James Central. Is 
the, the business, the Ministry of Energy and, and Small Business, I've made it clear that it has its eyes fixed on some significant considerations with reference to renewable energies. We understand and appreciate the fragile environment in which we live and the negative impact upon that environment by fossil fuel, fossil generated fuel and, and energies. We are aware, and I've sounded this again in this, the, the monopoly culture that operates in Barbados is something from which we want to escape. Not too long ago, we had almost a total shutdown of this country. Exposed again the, the vulnerability of the total economy, total way of life to dependence upon an energy monopoly. And therefore, as a result of that, the mandate falling to this minister and ministry is significant. And then, of course, the high cost attaching to energy, especially with reference to transport and electricity. Prime Minister mentioned it, Honorable Prime Minister mentioned it in passing today. I was glad that she did. Because we've been talking about moving to that renewable energy environment 100% by 2030. And we acknowledge that government has brought in a few electric buses. And that a few entities in private have brought in a few electric vehicles. But my concern was, and I'm glad the Prime Minister mentioned it, because I think the government needs to be deliberate, by example, and beyond the use of electric buses in public transport, such as the case now started, the government needs for its vehicle fleet to make sure that quickly that shift is made in that direction and lead by example. And then the government further needs to start to facilitate the environment within which people will start importing, when they do import vehicles, electric vehicles. Because 2030 is not that far distant from us. And the government is serious about this goal. Transportation is a significant sector that has to undergo change. And the government, therefore, by its tax and duty policy, the government therefore by other policy initiatives and by its own example with respect to its own fleet must signal the shift to the use of electric vehicles. Now I said before and I say again, when it comes to renewable energy, there's bound to be significant interest coming out of North America. Those North American investment interests will obviously challenge local domestic Barbadian investment interests. I believe already those tensions are beginning to result because there are entities who see it as their charge to make sure that they can grasp as much of the renewable energy market as possible. These are North American entities and therefore those local domestic interests which are not as well resourced or financially endowed will find a significant source of rivalry. Government policy obviously must take cognizance of that. I am not of the view that a 30% slice, I heard the Prime Minister sought to change the message a bit today by saying it is not 30% being allocated either to the marijuana industry or to the renewable energy, that 30% is a floor. Well, she said some people didn't understand that. Well, if that's the case, I have to admit I didn't understand that because I thought I heard very clearly in absolute terms that 30% slice was reserved for domestic investors, both marijuana and renewables. So the government's policy must take cognizance of those investment interests coming from North American foreign elements. Bearing in mind as well that although they set up and they do generate some economic activity and create some jobs and give the sector a boost, 
the, the, the end result largely is that they'll probably leak foreign exchange faster than they earn it. That's the story in part of tourism. That they earn foreign exchange, but they leak a lot of it. And a lot of it does not stay on ground. And we don't want to hear that to be the story of the um, renewable energy sector. And I would urge the minister also to consider with respect to existing domestic renewable energy uh, operations that we look carefully to see if in any way our policy is discriminatory. My sense is, and from my engaging people asking questions, people who are involved, my sense is that people, for instance, who are into solar, ter solar thermal energy initiatives feel a level of discrimination existing in terms of how policy is affected, as opposed to those who are much more interested in the photovoltaic types of systems and to the extent that the policy facilitates all aspects of renewable energy product, then I believe that the government needs to give serious attention to reducing any disparity in policy and removing any element of unfair um, disadvantage. We have to facilitate cost-effective financing of this sector if it's to get up and running, especially if we're to ward off the hawks of foreign investor, the foreign investment. We've got to facilitate cost-effective financing and capital access for renewable energies in Barbados. And I understand, for instance, when it comes to VAT impositions, there's a zero rated VAT policy applied to certain sectors of existing renewable energy activities and, sec and entities as opposed to others. I tried, and I'll try again, to invite the Honorable Minister to denounce this business of wealth consolidation, that model that I abhor, and I am sure he does too. But I want to hear him with full throat and voice denounce that wealth consolidation model in business in Barbados that still exists and which marginalizes small and medium enterprises, excludes them from uh, acquisition of contracts or access to contracts or even being at the table when contracts are discussed. I, I would like to hear him because I know he is not shy of speech and he is not for want of boldness, notwithstanding what others in his cabinet or, or around him in the government may think he will speak what he honestly feels, knows, and sees, and I invite him so uh, to do. Got to lessen the burden of taxation as it impacts small businesses. That's just like any, the energy sector as well. This is a bane of, of development of entrepreneurship in Barbados. The tax policy of government getting impacts. We cry that the water rates now impact farmers. Um, Small business people will tell you the water rates, electricity rates. We, we don't transport costs in Barbados. It's cheapest anywhere in the Caribbean. And we don't admit at the same time that energy costs, electricity rates are the highest in, in the Caribbean. And whatever the government can do to reduce the impact on small business through taxation policy, re-energy, I believe, and uh, taxation policy to the extent that it affects raw materials and supply costs, that would also be of help. Now, this government touts itself very loudly. It shouts and applauds itself very loudly when it makes provision for those who are distressed financially. So where is the work of the mitigation unit 
that is the broader work of the Ministry of Empowerment and Welfare Services, um, whether or not a small business is, is financial assistance in the COVID context to small businesses, et cetera, government shouts loudly. But the reality is that there are too many who hear these mouthings and who understand that these facilities are established, but at the end, they don't benefit. And it's not because they are registered, they are paying NIS, and they are registered as companies. It's not only that, that might be part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that for some reason, whatever it is, and usually it is the bureaucracy, the red tape that they have to go through around these uh, programs, the, the benefits are not reaching them. So don't tell a small business, we will give you X amount of dollars for a couple of months during COVID, and then you can't get it because of the bureaucratic, the bureaucratic red tape uses the excuse. Too many times that is happening. Too many times that is happening. I'm simply saying you have given hope to the people that such is going to be the case, then follow through on that and make sure that it happens. Small businesses are critical to the Barbadian economy. They gender employment, they enhance employment skills, they use indigenous resources, and they help to create some degree of wealth. Now, there is in St. Thomas, I think they call their Vaucluse, I ain't sure, a building built by a government of this country that still, I think, remains unused. I say that to say that it is part of the bane of small developing economies, that resources are used, facilities are created, programs are mounted, then it all comes to nothing because one administration has some significant problem with the doings of the other administration. Now, I am simply here to say that a country like Barbados, especially in these harsh times, and especially operating against the backdrop of the kind of debt levels that we've had to enter into, and especially in the last several months, last year, cannot afford this kind of nonsense. It happened with Sherburn not being finished. We all remember that, I think, it happened with Sherburn. It's happening now with this, 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 this building in Vaucluse. It happened for a while with the Thompson Clinic in St. John. And, and that is the practice of governments in small countries like ours, and the history is replete with examples right across the region. One administration has built it, and there may be issues related to that, but nothing of a substantial impediment which stops its use. It's just that we have a problem, and we, we make political mileage of the city. Well, these are Barbados resources, whether they're upfront resources or loan derived resources which we have to use. It amounts to wastage. It amounts to wastage. And we need to have a clear position. If the government has one, then the parliament needs to know it. The people need to be aware of it, that this is the position of the government on this matter. This building up there at Vaucluse. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time to talk about waste management policy. We're glad for the garbage trucks that we're seeing, although I'm still seeing, beginning to see again a re-emergent of a situation with the piles of garbage all over the place. I've been wondering what the problem, the problem is. But we have a problem as a country of managing waste, and I encourage this minister and his efforts to be stubbornly robust in seeking to instill in Barbadians the need to properly manage their waste and to properly dispose of their waste and to even make sure that there's a regularity 
a forceful arrangement in place that guarantees they move quickly, transport. I enunciated what I think ought to be the policy here, uh, Mr. Speaker, this, uh, this, this week in terms of transport, and that entails the government withdrawing substantially from the sector as the provider of commercial public transport, engage in social aspects of the transport, of the public of Barbados, um, allow the private sector to carry that, facilitate funding for the private sector, allow them to get capital access, bigger and better units. Uh, the government is strong in the regulatory environment to manage the process and to have a keen eye on what happens in the transport sector. The government carries the social uh, traffic, so to speak. Government subsidizes where down, down time or low commuter traffic periods could be subsidized by government financing of the private sector. Still saves you money, I believe. And where there are regions thought to be not viable, the government subsidizes again the private sector to go there in those times so that the public can be properly. Um, so I, I repeat that. I believe that that is where we need to go. There are a couple of questions, but I want to press and finish. Um, when it comes to design and construction of roadways, any prime minister passing mentioned that, and I was glad that she did, because the concern that I noted here as well in my preparation for today. We have two main coastal highways um, on the south and on the west. A lot of traffic every day. But significant portions of those two highways lie below the level of uh, the sea, sea level. And we are, as a small island developing states in this type of region, anticipating that climate change and um, rising tides will cause us significant problems. There are parts of Christchurch which are very obviously below the level of the sea. Uh, uh, very obviously, and the, the slightest thing brings water. And the same thing applies on the West Coast. So my question, what the Prime Minister mentioned in passing, in terms of the design and construction of roadways, especially on the coast, we're now working in major ways on the West Coast, and we will do the same on the South Coast. Design and construction, are we taking significantly enough into consideration the matter of um, how sea level rise and the closeness to the, the ocean, the coastal environment, should impact upon that design and that construction? And then, Mr. Speaker, you know on the West Coast, I think you know, um, always been concerned, as the Ministry of Home Affairs, this is a particular concern for us with respect to any um, pending threat of significant bad weather causing sea level rise along the west coast and occasioning the need to move people, um, Mr. Speaker, in a hurry, between University Drive and Fitz Village. Uh, I think, not Fitz Village, um, bottom of Holders Hill there. Um, um, between those two points. I don't think, I still think there is no way to get people off the coast and up inland in the event of emergency. And, and that is some distance. And I believe Barbados in 2021 should be able to find it possible to do this. And it passes through St. James Central, I think, maybe St. James South as well. And, and there's no access from University Drive there on the coast, Minister of, former Minister for Energy and Small MP for St. James Central. No, no access to, to get you off the coast road in a hurry up to, up to the inner, in the, the Holders Hill area, these kind of um, Hainesville area, that kind of place, and Hoyts, Hoyts Village and then kind of places, and Durance and then kind of, I know the place very well, watch yourself, and get you away from those environs so that you may escape any possible misfortune. That's a reality Barbados has faced. I think to a certain extent the same exists around a certain part of the Christchurch coast. Um, and that was a concern of the Ministry of Home Affairs with respect to disaster management. So I, I put that there for the consideration of the minister 
this would be worth a worthy capital works project as well. I'm sure it will generate economic activity, but it serves the interest of preserving um, life. Mr. Speaker, my nearly killed me at Gross Corner. He killed my Jeep, and that was buried same day. And I saw death come in, coming straight at me. And the Lord said, no, stop. And death stopped. And I escaped without a bruise. Amen, Amen indeed. And that was a little while before the last election. <laughs> Are you still saying amen? It was a little while before the last election. But but that 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 Groves Corner, you know it, Mr. Speaker, do you? Is is in Saint George, Saint Thomas, at least the Saint John, and at least the Sweet Vale or Sweet Bottom, and I mean, and at least the. Um, uh, fish upon and into St. Joseph. It's a dangerous place. And, and to me, simply, it can be addressed by making all of those roads all stop roads. You know, all stop road. We have all stop roads in the Ivy. You come to the junction, and every man, ja man jack stops. There's four across. Everybody stops. So even if you get a little bit mixed up as you move off, you won't get hit as hard. You, you're not likely to have fatalities or serious injury, Mr. Speaker. But that corner is dangerous because people coming from Bridgetown, whether they're going into Sweet Bottom, or whether they're going up the hill to go up into further parts of St. John, come at speed. And the corner is wide. And it is not a corner that is often debushed. So there's a lot of shrub, and tall shrub, some banana trees, etc., some other tall grass, if you're coming from the St. Joseph Bathsheba, you come, you stop there, Mr. Speaker. If that's not properly the bush, you can't see very far to your right. And even if it's the bush, you have a challenge. Because of a fellow coming up that road at a certain speed as that young fellow was that day, you are caught in the middle of the road. And he came straight and hit the vehicle, destroyed. He hit me so hard, Mr. Speaker. He knocked the right rear wheel from the right side of the vehicle, right around to the left side of the vehicle, turned it completely around. And I don't say it lightly, but I tell you, I saw death coming up the road, and the Lord said, stop. That corner needs to be checked, and I don't know if you need any roundabout, a lot of expenses, you don't even need traffic lights. If those people coming from town would have to stop and wait like anybody else, then that would help. Everybody should stop. Prior Park is bad. You know Prior Park, Mr. Speaker? Prior Park is bad. Are you going to support me on this? Come, top your hand. Prior Park is bad. Accidents happening regularly. Death waiting to happen. I come through there with my heart in my mouth. Especially if I'm coming. Sorry? I am up there very regularly. I spent many hours up there yesterday. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Many hours I spent up there yesterday trying to prepare for today's debate. So that corner is bad, Mr. Speaker. We, I think we all know it. All of us St. James, South and Central. That, that corner needs, it needs to do something about that. Lesser so perhaps, but also a problem, is that Salter's corner. What I'm saying in a broader context, we need to treat to some of these small things. They won't bring jobs necessarily, they won't excite the economy in any way necessarily, but they preserve lives, and maybe your life, maybe your life, a relative's life. And I invite the minister to, to look at that thing. I, I repeat this, you know, Mrs. Speaker, since last I was here, I mentioned this in passing, but I say it again. That William of Project, that vendor's project at Weymouth, fine. I, I wait to see its completion and how it will be used. I have my fears, but I wait to see the usefulness of it when the time comes. I'm not criticizing the project. But right now, 
that water course is in a mess. None of us here controls the weather. We do not know that tomorrow it will be a bright and sunny day without drizzle. Go down there past there, Mr. Speaker, and not far from St. Michael Central, and take a look at it. And I do not know how long it will remain like that. But even in its present state, it's a bother. And if permanently it is not to be addressed and engineering considerations have not been taken on board, that which um, is done to facilitate jobs and employment for young people in basic activity may turn out to be the bane of somebody else. If the flow of water through that course is impeded by the after situation, that water comes through your constituency, up to the back of Waterford, and Bellevue, and down through the prison gully, and down through the back of um, Dean's Village and Bridge Road, through South Central, and into city and makes its way to the ocean, hopefully. You're old enough, Mr. Speaker, to remember the flood of 1970. You have never seen water that high in Barbados. I've seen water that high never in Barbados. At the level of the goalposts, if you were wrong, you, you will recall. Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry died. Level of the goalposts. And that's the type of flooding that can result if that water course is not properly maintained and we get, unfortunately, the requisite level of the requisite level of rainfall. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I really need to talk about health and I need to talk about housing, and I will still not have covered half the ministries. Um, let me be very quick, not to take a lot of time. And again, I salute the Minister of Health for the effort in the arduous task if, in front of him. I still think we need to um, outline a clear uh, health financing strategy going forward. We need to speak to whether or not Barbados has the capacity and if there is a need for the kind of national health insurance that can help us to avoid the extreme out-of-pocket costs, which now constitutes the reality for most people, even for people with means, with the wherewithal, are crying out when they have to seek medical health in relation to the costs. Compare that with people who are not people of substance and means, who having benefited from public health care, still have to make recourse to some elements of, of public service for which you have to pay, or then to some private facilities, and there's a cost. And therefore, I invite the government to say whether or not they're considering a national health uh, insurance of some sort that would help us with that um, situation. We have seriously to transform the national health profile. It is hard to say that NCDs is a problem, but what significantly are we doing to uh, address that? I believe a large part of that, I think the Prime Minister came close to saying that, I think it was the Honorable Prime Minister or maybe it was Minister of Health, a large part of that will have to be involved in a community health related oriented program. And that is where it starts. It's a change in lifestyle, it's a change in culture, it's a matter of education, and it's a matter of uh, where the rubber meets the road on the ground, and having a community health program that addresses the business of transforming our national health profile for various reasons, economic reasons, health reasons, et cetera. But certainly we need to do that. Um, Addiction is a big problem now. I spent a lot of time. I, I invite again the interest of the ministry in seeing how better we can be because we have all kinds of addictions manifesting themselves. Not only addiction to marijuana or other drugs, but there are all kinds of addictions plaguing Barbadian society. And some of them not as obviously ugly as others, but they are addictions nevertheless. And the fact that people are given to them by force of habit, habit and without self control. But addiction and mental health big issues that we are now stressing ourselves over. Now, with respect to housing, quickly, the former tenantries program, I, I alluded to its benefits earlier. 
I, with the Urban um, um, Development Commission, a Rural Development Commission, I think they're now called the National Development Commission, but it seems as though they're nationally stalled um, commissions. And these are substantial programs that help to move people from a situation of dependency and poverty to a, pos a, a position of potential wealth generation. Land insecurity, lack of tenure is the big problem in housing in Barbara. My view, I say it again, is that the focus of the NHC, Ministry of Housing, in bringing people into ownership should start with land and not start with the provision of a house, whether it's sold or rented. Of course, you have to provide some rental units. That is to be understood. But I think it's a question of providing land. Government has to find that land to the extent it, that, that it does not now own it and find a facility for transferring that land to the ownership of poor people who would then be encouraged to and facilitated in building. The history and tradition of Barbados, a lot of poor people built their own houses because they had the spot to build it on. You don't have a spot, they have to look for house, you have to look for land. Government can't provide it, private sector does, then it comes at a cost which is prohibitive. I heard the old member of St. Thomas mention this in the, in the um, the, the well section of this debate, uh, so I, I didn't mention it then, but I believe, as she does, that we need to have a strong, well-functioning, first-time homeowners finance facility. A strong, well-functioning, first-time homeowners financing facility. I also joined with the member for St. Michael East in saying that I recall clearly the Prime Minister spoke with much exuberance and enthusiasm and seeming resolve about changing the whole character of the developments in the pine and spoke with reference to demolishing existing units because they had served their purpose. They were overpopulated and therefore given rise to all kinds of uh, negative features of life that people don't have to be made to endure. And I understood that to mean that there would be an effort at some stage to renew the housing stock and quantity there, and that a massive project of demolition and rebuilding would take place. I, I understood that. I'm telling you I understood that. I'm telling you I heard that with both these ears. And I was surprised to hear the Honorable Prime Minister say today that it was an exercise in fancy. I heard that with my own ears. I'm telling you I ain't asking anybody. I heard that spoken too. And um, if it is not to be because of constraining circumstances, then fine. But you can't rebuff the honorable member by saying that he's taking or making an exercise in fancy, because I heard it myself. And then there's this HOPE project for which I invite clarity. In terms of government's position, read this HOPE project. Now I heard about direct HOPE, I suppose indirect HOPE, and, and that there were two levels of, of uh, quality with respect to housing accommodation to be offered. And some would uh, see to these, um, if you're working for $4,000 or less, and others obviously above that. But I, I call for clarity on this business of the whole project. Now, this party in government here was able to shake itself free of the notion of the presence of white shadows. This government spent time and was able to shake itself free of the perception, the notion that it was subjected to the presence and influence of white shadows. My humble submission is that we may be seeing the re-emergence of white shadowy figures. And as government must guard against the re-emergence of white shadowy figures exercising influence on its policies. So tell me what hope is about. Tell me who is involved in hope. Tell me how we are going to go about it. Tell me who are going to construct these houses and under what circumstances and conditions and the arrangements and, and all of the rest. The same thing goes for these pre-conco houses that the other members and Andrew talked about a couple of days ago that I wasn't even aware of. But I urge the government to guard against the re-emergence 
of white shadowy figures exerting influence and courting favor from its policy um, decisions. What is to be the role of the National Housing Cooperation? It is to be restructured, but does it give way to hope and to the projects of Preconco and that type of arrangement? What is to be the restructured profile of the National Housing Cooperation? Quickly, Mr. Speaker, word on climate change, resilience building. The United States administration has undergone change recently. The administration that disconnected itself from the Paris Accords and stuff like that. The administration that did not buy into belief of the impact pending already with us of climate change and such like that has gone. There's a new administration that seeks to rejoin the Paris Accord. A new administration that has put an end to the major massive pipeline project out of Canada into the United States. A new administration that gives credence to the impact of um, climate change. And I am suggesting very strongly that the Barbados government, since it seems to be projecting itself as a leader in many respects in the Caribbean and internationally today, take the lead in encouraging a Caribbean lobby, a regional lobby, engaging this new United States administration on matters of climate change and climate change resilience building. Now, it is in our interest. It is also in the interest of the U.S. Now, the U.S. government, in terms of its policies, normally is not robustly encouraged to pursue anything in partnership with anybody that does not serve its interests. So where there are common or mutual interests, then the United States is open to that. And I'm saying Barbados government needs to encourage the rest of CARICOM to mount to engage in a serious lobby with this new United States administration, a regional approach. We haven't had anything of any significance offered by the United States to the countries of this region since the Caribbean Basin Initiative. I think that was under uh, Ronald Reagan, and what, that's 70s, 80s early? Under Reagan, long, long time. The, the only hemispheric uh, um, initiative in which this sub-region Caribbean has been engaged is, I think, the petro Caribbean out of Venezuela, and Barbados wasn't a part of that, certain other countries in the OECS. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, I, I am simply saying, but I am strongly suggesting that we engage the new U.S. Climate change presents opportunities for new employment, innovation, more productive capital development, the kind of capital infrastructure that can help us. We know of its impact on tourism and fisheries and infrastructure and agriculture. I just, I'm making a, a, a reference, Mr. Speaker, to a document entitled Developing World Must Get Ready to Adapt Its Trade to Climate Change. And, um, in that yes, yes, Mr. Speaker, of course, with your leave. And it refers in part to the fact that climate change should be a prime subject of consideration for the for this region because of our vulnerability. In the space of 200 years, we have put back, I'm quoting, into the atmosphere most of the CO2 that nature had spent millions of years absorbing from it. Now we are beginning to see the consequences, Mr. Speaker. Climate change may seem to be evolving slowly at times, but the changes it produces are emerging at a quickening pace. The initial effects are already with us. It speaks to agriculture and fisheries and tourism, which will continue to be the sectors which will be hit hardest. And these are the sectors upon which we now rely mostly. And this has therefore far reaching consequences for us. There are areas of critical trade. Mr. Speaker, listen to this. Agriculture, fisheries, and tourism 
account for 17% of export from developing countries, more than 24% of exports from least developed countries, and around 35% of exports from small island developing states, and that's in 2019, that's now. And therefore, th these are critical things. What do we need to do? There's no other option. Countries must urgently start planning and implementing actions to adapt their production and trade to the unforgiving effects of climate change. There's a growing need for countries to adapt production methods, identify new comparative advantages, invest and diversify the economies while building respective value chains. Such actions should ensure trade resilience as climatic conditions worsen, is what we call trade climate re readiness. What does it mean? It means novel crops and cropping methods, intensified irrigation and farming, more sustainable fishing methods, new fishing grounds. For the tourism sector, it implies moving tourism infrastructure to higher ground and adapting tourism offers in line with climate, climatic conditions. We have a, a policy vision, Mr. Speaker, which sees us d d developing significantly so in the next few years. Um, coastal tourism architecture or infrastructure. The vision of the Prime Minister. Several hotels and other facilities related to tourism develop along our lower south coast and our lower west coast areas. That runs counter to the emphasis on the urgency that this very government is putting on matters of climate change and resilience and coastal vulnerability. Now, I'm not saying the two can't exist together. I'm simply saying that when you talk about coastal vulnerability in context of climate change and building resilience, and at the same time talk developing major tourism coastal infrastructure, at the same time, you've got to consider the tensions and what do you have to build in? What do you have to build in to ward off the expected effects of um, climate change? This document suggests, Mr. Speaker, the trend is to move um, tourism, architectural, infrastructure development more indoors. I, I'm going to stop there. There's, there's several other paragraphs that we could have quoted, but I think you get the point, Mr. Speaker. And brief. I'm saying here today that government needs to speak with a louder voice and a greater degree of certainty to the business of growth and how growth is projected in these estimates. Government needs to give a fuller disclosure on the matter of debt and the implications of where we now are and where we are likely to be, especially if we consider responding to things like climate change and how we're going to repay the debts that we now owe the ones we are likely to incur. Government needs to tell this country that right now we are sort of on pause, on pause from a BERT program in some respects, primary surplus, debt management, but these things will change once we get past COVID. And that the estimates here, where they may make some reference to what has been occasioned by our response in the past year to COVID, must look past COVID and construct a platform for dynamic growth. And that the ministries that are being allocated these monies must take cognizance of this fact. That if at the end of the day we spend all of this money and it's only to construct a survivalist platform, rather than a launching pad for growth, we miss the mark. We cannot, we cannot exist in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a phase where we feel we are forever constrained. We've got to begin to show that our policy orientation suggests that we are going to break the shackles, develop these new sectors. Where's the evidence with respect to renewables, technology, um, diversification in agriculture? Diversification, where is the evidence? Tourism, where, where is the ev ev evidence in here? And these documents should speak to those things. This exercise to me doesn't end here this week. It doesn't end when it reaches the upper house. This exercise continues public debate out there in the arena where it matters most. Because people need to feel that the government is on a good and proper path and that what it has indicated to us in documented form is truly telling of where it wants to take us and is clearly outlining for us 
the challenges which we will face as we, as we proceed towards that goal. And I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your indulgence. And I really didn't intend to go beyond an, an hour. Uh, I didn't. But I will quit now. I'll leave some for next time. I thank you, sir. I am Member St. James Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. Um, I would want to begin, sir, by frankly congratulating the Leader of the Opposition for what has generally, by his standards, been one of the better presentations that he has made during his sojourn in the House during this session. Um, I note, Mr. Speaker, that unfortunately from time to time there was evidence of incomprehension and I, I'm not sure whether that is deliberately so or whether that is as a result of a deficiency on his part. I note equally, sir, that there were some inconsistencies and incongruities in his presentation. Um, and I'd be specific, I mean, he, he spoke accurately about the importance of medical tourism, for example, Mr. Speaker, but then would want to descend unnecessarily and derogate um, the government um, by virtue of an alleged assault on Dominica. How the two of them become compatible, sir, only he knows. Um, he, 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 he speaks, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the importance of a housing program in the context of governments ensuring that the private sector is able to partner with government to spur um, development and economic activity. All of that is perfectly correct, but at the same time and in the same breath, he again seeks to descend and necessarily so into white shadowy figures and the role that they play, um, begging the question, Mr. Speaker, sir, of what specifically he refers to and whether he has a particular preference for the Asian community or some other community as opposed to those of European extract. Um, Mr. Speaker, the truth of the matter is that it, is also, it was also a presentation that was characterized by his customary penchant, his tendency, sir, for, politi for being politically mischievous and, um, uh, and vandalizing the ideas put forward by the Honorable Prime Minister when she spoke, taking them out of context and trying to reproduce them in a way that would not be in any way near what she sought to put to this house. And I, and I, I, didn't, I did not shout across the floor when the Honorable Member was speaking, sir. And I, I would prefer if he would allow me to speak without the interruption. Um, but Mr. Speaker, you know, if I was a journalist, and I was to try to sum up all that he said and create a headline from it. Unfortunately, the headline would not be complimentary to the leader of the opposition because the theme that he constantly struck was one which effectively said, let the people suffer. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, the reality is that you cannot look at an intervention on the part of the government of Barbados, for example, and he, he alluded to several. One that comes to mind immediately is the BEST program. An intervention, Mr. Speaker, sir, aimed at training workers who we all know in this country needed to have and still need to have the benefit of ongoing training so that they, at an individual level, can maximize their potential as part of the human resource product of Barbados. Uh, an initiative like the BEST program, Mr. Speaker, sir, that seeks to make sure that there's infrastructural development in the hotel and hospitality sector generally, so that people with disabilities do not feel that they are alienated in Barbados if they come here on vacation, so that, Mr. Speaker, sir, the hospitality sector can benefit from green energy and be competitive as it must, so that, Mr. Speaker, sir, hotels where people are going to spend a week or two or however long are, are, are immediately seen as being attractive and, and, and a place which is desirable to be at. Well, how do you find fault with that effort, Mr. Speaker, sir? Um, and of course, also, you can't forget, 
continuity of employment. Because he, he actually sought to belittle the fact that you're trying to encourage people to make sure that staff work, even though we know that the hotels are way below optimal level. You heard the Prime Minister today, sir, 6,000 people in the space of three months or four. And you're trying to find a way creatively to put people back to work. And the Honourable Member deprecates that. That should be on the ash heap, according to him, sir. It got to go back to the drawing board. Because it is it's as though there's a crass egoism at work and not the interest of the people. And Mr. Speaker, sir, the question that I, I'd say to you, if I was a journalist, I would have to say that he's trying to suggest that we should not do these things to intercede on behalf of humanity, intercede on behalf of the folks that sent us here, but, sir, that we should let the people suffer. And that is not what this Barbados Labour Party is about. And that is not where we are going to go, Mr. Speaker, sir. Um, he laments the fact that we have not prioritized a growth platform. And I do not know that that is accurate, first of all, because the Prime Minister was very clear that this, this, these estimates speak to three things in particular. First of all, and not least of all, is the, 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 the duty that we have to protect the vulnerable amongst us, Mr. Speaker, sir. We all heard her articulate that today. She also spoke, Mr. Speaker, sir, to the question of expanding the public sector's role in the program of growth. And it must only, and it can only come at this time from public sector leading it, because we know that there has been a veritable implosion in the private economy and that all businesses in Barbados, whether large, medium, small, or micro, have suffered immeasurably. And Mr. Speaker, sir, how then are they going to be the ones generating the growth? And even if he was sincere, and I, wanted, I want to think he is, because he's an honorable member of this place and must never speak out of insincerity. Mr. Speaker, sir, the only other place the growth could come from is if it was induced by foreign people the same foreign people who he has in this same speech deprecated their involvement in sectors like medicinal marijuana and renewable energy. So this is why I say it is laced, it is riddled, Mr. Speaker, sir, with incongruity and inconsistency. It is though it was written by three or four different people and hemmed together badly. No, no, Mr. Speaker, sir, the other side of the coin is, of course, that... Um, the, the, the estimates speak to the duty of the government to maintain a careful and vigilant eye on the matter of mitigating and blunting the effect of pain on the people of Barbados and the need for them to be able to survive, first of all. So, Mr. Speaker, without belittling in any way, I want to repeat myself for clarity, without in any way seeking to belittle the importance of the issue of growth, the first and overriding objective of this government must be to blunt the pain that the people are feeling in their households across this island. And Mr. Speaker, sir, in that regard, we are no different to any other country on planet Earth, quite frankly. And if you look at what has happened in our economy, the Prime Minister began by pointing us to the fact that 1.5 billion, in fact, she said 2 billion, there's been a $2 billion contraction in economic activity in this country. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, that is a reality that you have to confront. And you need not be told, because you are a sociologist by, by, by training, that when you have that kind of contraction, it falls disproportionately on the shoulders of the poor and the working class and the already marginalized more heavily than it falls on those people who are in the upper echelons of society because the people in the upper echelons of society have a comfort level to fall back on. They've got a thing called savings, Mr. Speaker, sir, and investments, Mr. Speaker, sir. The poor people don't have that benefit. But we are not alone around the world in this situation. And I want to share with the leader of the opposition because I really do like the gentleman. Um, and I am for, I'm happy, sir, that the Lord intervened and saved him from death. Um, I am happy, sir, that he is amongst us today. I am unhappy that the circumstances created were created deliberately 
for him to sit where he now sits. But that's a different matter. But Mr. Speaker, sir, the reality is that if you look at the United Kingdom, in 3rd of March this year, Chancellor Sunak of the United Kingdom, the Minister of Finance, went to their parliament and told their parliament that there was a 9.7% decline in the UK economy, a contraction of almost 10% of economic activity in the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker, sir. And that their priority was financial support by way of jobs, sir, and focusing on jobs, sir, and, and, and that there was a circumstance of profound uncertainty facing the United Kingdom. And that is the reason why they had to plow, at this stage, money into financial, financial support for businesses and for micro-enterprises. All the things that we've been doing, Mr. Speaker, all of the things that you see in Barbados, helping the, the shopkeepers, helping, sir, the, the beauticians, helping, sir, the mommy and daddy enterprises, the little two and three people businesses, sir, to help them survive, to keep them from becoming part of the losses that the society has to absorb and the dislocation. Canada, no different. The Canadian economy has contracted by 4.7%, Mr. Speaker, sir, since COVID and as a result of COVID. Across the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the so-called major industrial powers on planet Earth, there is an average contraction, sir, in their economy of 4.3%. And in the mighty United States of America, January 28th, Reuters carried a story saying that the gross domestic product in the United States since COVID had, de had, had decreased by 5.7%. Some 2.2%, sir, in 2019-20, and 2020-21, sir, 3.5%. The worst performance in the US economy since the Great Depression of 1929. It is as though the leader of the opposition is not familiar or is not part of that solid and concrete inescapable reality that this nation has to confront and which the whole world has to confront. We are no different to anybody else, Mr. Speaker. And, 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 and for us, it was simply an external shock that impacted on Barbados. Now, where I have my challenge with the leader of the opposition because the, the, the external shock really is the, this disease that have arise from outside on us. We ain't creating a COVID, but we got to deal with it. We had to make the adjustments to it. And last estimates, last year only, in fact, they took place in this room, sir, because we had already moved up here from the um, original place of parliament. The prime minister, no less, indicated to this house that she was going to introduce uh, via a system of, of counter-cyclical measures. Uh, and, and by what, what do I mean by counter-cyclical measures, sir? Those approaches to financial policy that would have the highest impact on jobs and on job security and the lowest possible impact, Mr. Speaker, sir, on the revenues of the Crown and the fiscal position. And she said here last year in March, a year ago, sir, that that counter-cyclical policy would have to be um, um, taken on board if we were to navigate Barbados safely, my words, not hers, out of, the, out of the circumstances that were at that time threatening us, just threatening. So a year ago, we made it clear to the House that we were going to focus on this matter of jobs and on the survival of the people of the country, Mr. Speaker, because nobody is going to poo-poo or, or to diminish or make slight of the importance for there to be growth. But the reality is nobody's putting growth as the first priority now. You've got to talk about stabilization. You've got to talk about recovery long before you can get to the growth issue, Mr. Speaker, sir. And the, we have to stabilize the country in the aftermath of the impact of COVID-19. And the leader of the opposition, I believe, knows better. He also knows, Mr. Speaker, sir, that we would have agreed, sorry, that the prime minister would have indicated to the House over a year, uh, a year ago that she was going to in, um, approach the IMF with a view to relaxation of the primary balance under the, the extended funding facility through which we obtain our, our um, loan arrangements with them now. 
and that that primary balancer would move from 6% at the time to 3% so as to create for Barbados an additional $150 million in fiscal space, sir, in view of the reality that we were confronting, that there would be diminished revenues. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, for the leader of the opposition a year later to come here and to say that, or well, not say, to suggest, because one thing about him, sir, you know, he never actually says anything directly, but he has a snide way of making a suggestion without specifically stating it. So it is patently obvious what he's referring to, but he can jump up and say, I didn't say so. <clears throat> and he suggests to this house just now, Mr. Speaker, sir, and I tell you, you know, it's a, it is a speech laden with mischief. That, um, that there is a, a, a concern that he has about the punishment, effectively, that we will be meted out because we have brought down the, the um, primary balance and we began at 6%, but now you've it's gone down lower, below 3 I believe. And when now you have to pay back this money, they're going to be a... You know, there's going to be a heavy imposition. No, there's nobody who has said, first of all, that it will ever go back above 6% again. That's the first thing. And everybody was fighting. And you know, this is not rocket science. Don't mind the IMF is involved. If I have a mortgage, sir, and there's a challenge in paying the mortgage, you go to the bank and say, I got a challenge in paying the mortgage, but I got 20 years on this mortgage. Can I extend to 25? Give me a little bit more time. It don't mean that I got to pay more when the month comes. There's a different way of doing it. I just extend the length, the tenor of the, of the loan repayment. But the opposition ain't going to tell you nothing like that because he, sir, is wrapped up in this mischievous mood even at the expense of the country, including the people of, of, of St. Michael West who sent him there. Even in spite of their pain, sir, can't rein himself back in. Got a fishbone in his throat called Mia Amor Motley, whoever that is. And he can't see past it, get past it, Mr. Speaker, sir. So there, there's this reaction, this suggestion of punitive levels of, of treatment coming from the IMF, sir. No merit in it at all. Then, sir, he looks across at the Honorable Member for St. Philip South, the Minister of Agriculture, and start on him. Now, poor soul, he didn't expect any broadside. He was here busy doing some reading and so on. I heard the sharp intake of breath next to me. I thought that the Honorable Member was going to have a, was going to have a catastrophic failure of the heart. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, I was taken aback. <clears throat> this, this talk about the medicinal marijuana and how there's this, this sinister thing afoot to make sure that, that, that foreign people and, and but he didn't use the term white shadows then, but he said foreign people will take advantage of the medicinal marijuana opportunities to, to the extent that they humbug and marginalize Barbadians. Oh, Mr. Speaker, sir, nothing further can be, nothing can be further from the truth. And the leader of the, the government stood in her place today and pointed out that 30%, if you want to have a, an investment, and you're coming from outside the Barbados, you want to make an investment in the industry, you're welcome. But you must be welcome, sir. You, the country is open for business. And I defy anybody seeking political office in this country to make a case to me that you should not welcome foreign investment in Barbados. So if that is what they're going to be about, let them come out of the darkness and say so in the light. Are you or are you not for foreign investment in the country? But do not tell me that a government that has clearly defined the rules, that if you're going to be a foreign investor, find a Barbadian partner to partner with you up to 30%. That, that is alienating Barbadians, Mr. Speaker, sir. To do that is to do a devilish and wicked thing to the people to play with their psyche, because the honorable leader must understand the English language. You are welcoming the foreign investor who can bring millions of dollars to the investment. But what we are saying is find a Barbadian to partner with you, so that at least up to 30% of that six or seven million dollar investment you want to make coming from a Barbadian grouping. 
It don't have to be an individual. It could be a consortium of Barbadians. Put them together. There are Barbadians who want to invest too. But we are taking along the Barbadian community. How could that, how on earth, Mr. Speaker? Let's be real now. How could that be a problem? And then, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is abundantly clear. If you want, if you're a Barbadian and you want to invest, are you entitled to do so up to 100% of whatever it is you want to invest? You don't go and look for an outside person to invest with? So that renders the argument of the leader of the opposition completely empty. It was better for him had he not spoken on the matter at all. At least then I might have been of the view that he didn't understand. Not that he, didn't, not that he was going to be mischievous about the extent of his understanding. But Mr. Speaker, sir, I do not know how it would be possible in the context of COVID-19. And all that we have seen happen, the pain felt in my constituency, and I presume in others as well. To speak in this debate, sir, without speaking to the, the, the fact that the pandemic has exposed huge inequalities in this society and in this economy. As I said to you, Mr. Speaker, I need not tell you this because you understand it as a trained sociologist. The poorest amongst us feel the pain more. That explains why you had to have this massive logistical mobilization called care packages, trying to reach every household and every village community in Barbados, Mr. Speaker, sir. And, and, I, and I deprecate the view as well, pub, pub, peddled about by some ungrateful people in the Democratic Labour Party who got care packages, the Democratic Labour Party got care packages in a way that surprised them because they didn't expect the head of government to come and say, hold on to these, how much of a thousand they got. But then they put it abroad out there, Mr. Speaker, sir, that they got some constituencies where people grab up six and seven and eight packages and the people licorice and that and so on and so forth. Not putting into context the reality that, Mr. Speaker, if I got a family of 10, and in my constituency there are families of 10, if I got a family of 15, and in my constituency, there are families of 15, that two or three bags, sir, is not going to be sufficient. Yeah. It ain't that the people are whatless, or that the people um, are licorice, or any of the de deprecating things they like to say about poor black people. It is, Mr. Speaker, sir, that there is an instinct called survival, mm -hmm. and that there is a hardship on the land. Better it would have been for them, the critics to mobilize a little help too, instead of standing in splendid isolation and finding fault as they did. And Mr. Speaker, sir, you know Peter Tosh, who was as uncompromisingly rebellious as I am told I am, used to make it very clear, sir, that you gotta stand up for equal rights and justice. And this government, sir, posited, posited a policy of equality of rights and justice in this pandemic. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that it was given to my ministry to try to correct some of the deficiencies that would take place. Because when you tell the vendor who is already struggling, in fact, I will use the language of the streets, hustling to make a living, to feed your little daughter and your little son or hold the bills together for a week, because that is the planning horizon at that lower level of the society, Mr. Speaker, sir. Not only the opposition who's sitting down on a salary of nearly $100,000 when the year come from this position alone, granted by the, constitution, by the constitutional office he holds, Mr. Speaker, sir. Those people aspire to one day see one-tenth of that in the space of a year, far less, Mr. Speaker, sir, in the, in, uh, the 10 times it. And therefore, when you tell a vendor who is trying to subsist on $200 or $250, sir, that person understands that a government that is interested in equality of society and treatment and justice, Mr. Speaker, that, that person understands that the minister saying or the prime minister saying, contact the office, $250 will be made available to you this week. They understand, they understand the social commitment behind that. The shopkeeper, sir, and let me take the opportunity from this place to correct those people. Again, now there's a sportsperson, and I try my best because I understand the youngster 
believes, and he has been misled to believe, that to make an entree into public life, you've got to tell enough lies and be extremely sensational and so on. But there's a youngster who poses as a, or passes himself off as a spokesperson on business. And he would have, by way of a WhatsApp meme sent out, a little three minute blurb in response to the three or four hours I did the presentation the other day, saying that shopkeepers are, were promised $750 a week, but now the government changed it to $500 and they tell nobody. Patently untruthful, without any foundation in fact. Every shopkeeper in Barbados is entitled to get the $750 a week for the period that the directives had the shops closed. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, the reality is that, I, and if you say to me that you wish the money go faster, why be the first boy to say that that's true? Well, you, I've stood here before you, Mr. Speaker, sir, and said it. I wish we could dispense the money faster. Two weeks ago, this is now the beginning of the third week, this parliament would have approved a uh, supplementary for me to allow my ministry to get $6.5 million so that we will have the additional funds to bring on board the fisher folk and the taxi community, Mr. Speaker, sir. But government is what government is, and there is a process which has to involve the Treasury, not just in here. It has to involve, sir, the necessary warrants being sent up and approved, etc., etc. And it doesn't all happen overnight, like buying fast food. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, sir, we are doing our best to make sure that the money is available to the people who must get it. But do not create your own facts. Do not put it out there that that which has been committed to people has suddenly been changed. Not true. And he can do better than that, I am sure, if he wants to find a way of people noticing his existence. I, 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 I go no further at that at this stage. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, in total, $10 million has been made available for my ministry in particular to treat to small and micro businesses by way of COVID relief. I have already said, you know, sir, $10 million in the context of what happened between January and today. It was in October that I came to this parliament, Mr. Speaker, sir, and got $12 million more for the trust fund and for fund access by way of supplementary. So that in the totality of the last five months, sir, we have made $22 million available for the relief of small people in Barbados. I invite anybody to point me to a country in the Eastern Caribbean which has done that for its, its people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I also am of the view that we have to understand that this thing goes further because as the, the Prime Minister said today and said quite rightly, there is a need, you can take, you know, I believe I may have said it on last Monday when I spoke, you could take 20, 30, 40, 50 million and just make it available to people. There are realities that we have to deal with. And if the leader of the opposition wants to talk about growth, I will engage him. If he, wear, if he wore a beard, I will use the language of Shakespeare, because I don't wear one either. But we can beard each other in Denmark, face to face. Mr. Speaker, if you want to talk about growth, because you will never get small and micro business growth to take place unless you hold the hand of the smaller micro business people and navigate them through the pitfalls of doing business in this country. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is a reality that there are people out there who, are, who decide, boy, I now lost my job because the company closed down. They can't do no better because of COVID. What are you going to do? You know what? I could cook. I can start up a little food thing. And I started up. I do not know. No one has taught me anything about accounts payable. No one has taught me anything about accounts receivable and managing those accounts, Mr. Speaker, sir. Even if I got a little quick training and they train me for two or three weeks, by the time I hustling about to get the ingredients, I'm hustling to get the things transported to me, and hustling to get this and that, sir, I have no time. I, have, I, 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 I may, after the month, forget the little quick training I have had. There's nobody coming in to work with me. So that the training in the, in the way in which you navigate the pitfalls is absolutely critical. But the would-be sportsmen outside of this place for the Democratic Labour Party don't ever part his lips to speak to these matters. He's talking about money, 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 money. 
And, and in here, Mr. Speaker, sir, he who speaks about himself in the third person, we do this and we do that, as, and to create the impression, mischievously so, because he knows better, create the impression that he has a party of a lot of people, when the one body he had left him shortly after the by-election defeat in St. George and has never been seen again. So that reality is, sir, the we is me. And, 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 and Mr. Speaker, sir, he does not speak to these things either. I have said, sir, that we have to train our small and micro business people to understand how they develop a business plan. Because if you ain't got a business plan, you may be perfectly well intentioned, but you have to understand how to develop your business. Sir, you have to understand how to market that which you, you, are, you, are, you are producing or selling. Somebody go to train you in that, and somebody has, sir, to help you develop the plan. It don't just happen by accident, sir. And all too often in Barbados, we are untrue to ourselves. In the same way that we know that there are members of your profession and mine, Mr. Speaker, sir, the legal profession, who desperately need little help in managing their office accounts. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is true that there is a concourse sitting at Grantley Adams International Airport. And I, sir, having served as Minister of International Transport and called for it, must tell you that I'm done with that, and up to now I can't find the marketing or business plan. But I know it was there to operate as a business. So if you've got multiple billions of dollars in investments sitting down there, and you can't show me the business plan, the marketing plan, what about the little fella, sir? that has a $2,000 investment, but he needs to have the assistance too. And somehow people believe out here that it just can drop from the air, that you don't have to work with these people and hold the hand. And that's why generation after generation, we have seen black businesses in Barbados fail, Mr. Speaker, sir. Lady the opposition won't talk about growth. You can't have any growth until when you teach people how to succeed first. Now how to develop the wealth, how to create the wealth. The intergenerational wealth, not just the wealth for this generation. And that means business continuity, not business closure, Mr. Speaker. But if you look into the, 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 the um, Eurocentric community in Barbados, what he likes to call white shadowy figures, he will see that a lot of those businesses go back 50 years, 100 years, family one after the other, father to son to son to son. It has to happen in the black community too. I make no apology for saying that. Equal rights in the land of our birth. And to make it happen, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have to breach this, this bulwark there that is called neglect. That year after year, decade after decade, politicians in this country have sought to neglect working class people who go into business and say they know nothing about entrepreneurship, that they are lazy. It was the language of the plantation, Mr. Speaker, sir. It can be the language of 2021 and beyond. And so therefore, we have now to work with these people because the man out there, even though you scoff at him, you won't look down at him because he's selling peanuts. The man out there who's selling the peanuts and the coconuts, Mr. Speaker, is an entrepreneur in the same way as the man who opened up a paint factory. Huh? The color of the skin should not be the problem here. It has to be the commitment of the government to support and to uplift, Mr. Speaker, and to help them to understand. Two more minutes. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, two minutes is insufficient time. It really is. Um, I, I, I feel, Mr. Speaker, sir, that there's a duty also to speak to another question um, with regard to where we have gone in the assistance of people. Because, you know, throughout COVID, we have talked only about the business community as though the ordinary families don't exist. This government, sir, must be regarded for its heroic effort in trying to reach out to families, ordinary families, like your, your constituents and mine, Mr. Speaker. Households where none were employed were provided a minimum income of $600 a month. The leader of the opposition just spoke in the aftermath of a year when this country went through COVID pain and did not once in his speech collide with the fact that this is the first time in the history of post-independent Barbados that there has been a government that has reached out so magnanimously to assist people. Not only did the government reach out, it is the first time, Mr. Speaker, sir, that the government has built a linkage between those in the society who have with those in the society who have not. And then you had an Adopt a Families program. Did you hear the leader of the opposition speak to any of this, sir? Did you hear him? Let's talk about white shadowy figures. 
It was the white shadowy figures that were approached and said, look, man, you're making a lot of money in this country. Try and make some available, please, to help your neighbor across the street who is in less happy circumstances than you are. At least $600 a month. And that Adopt the Families program, Mr. Speaker, sir, would have raised funds to help this government carry the load of making sure that there was economic survival and not social chaos and mayhem because people were hungry and protesting. You know what happened in some parts of the Caribbean? Do, do you know that, sir? That there are some parts of this English-speaking Caribbean where people felt so neglected that they had to protest in the streets. Not in Barbados, sir. And we have a leader of the opposition who takes it for granted. Who feels that it's just a matter of waving a wand and feels, sir, that he is too large. He is too large to say, well done, that you all tried. You may not have been perfect. And I don't lay any claim, sir, that this government could be perfect. We will make our mistakes. But do not come and make it seem as though we are, are trying to encourage consolidation of wealth. He went so far as to ask me, ask me how I feel about consolidation of wealth. But Mr. Speaker, sir, for his benefit, he wants me to be clear-throated. I despise the consolidation of wealth. I would do anything in my power to break the back of it. And uh, Mr. Speaker, so that is why programs like the Financial Inclusion One and the Collateral Registry, which is going to make sure that we break the ancient architecture of getting a loan in Barbados. If you don't got a piece of land, if you're born poor, and if you're born black, you can't access a loan, not even for $5,000, because people come and say, you want a little collateral? I will say the trust loans now, because the trust loans will help you with that. So let me go a little higher. Let me say $10,000. Sir, these people must be given a new opportunity because when you paint in nails, at least they've got some accounts receivable because some boy oil is something. You can show that to the bank as part of your collateral. If, sir, you are a mechanic and you have auto parts and you've got equipment, that's part of your collateral. If you're a fisherman, Mr. Speaker, sir, you've got two or three boats, that is your collateral. There are too many people who are asset rich, sir, in terms of the movable assets. But they ain't got no land. They ain't got a house to call their own. They won't work hard. They're not lazy. They're not indifferent. They're not shiftless Negroes, as they have been called throughout history and treated up until this point. So you want to know how I feel, Mr. Speaker, sir? Let me tell you how I feel. I, Kerry Simmons, the member for St. James Central, believe that the back of consolidation of wealth in this country is a wicked and terrible thing that's held back too many people for too long and the day that that dies must come and come soon. That's how I feel, sir. That's how I feel. And I, therefore, something like I a collateral remember, red registry. I, I hear you're coming home now, sir. Something that, like a collateral Did registry you? that allows us to make sure that the, the movable assets of our people... I remember you, I, earlier you spoke about a concord or something like that, correct? That yes, was, that yes, was yes. land waste or something like that? that, 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 that please, that's part. Pl please utilize the Concord then to come and, 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 and let them come down. That, that can't fly, sir, so I will join it. Utilize come some, down. something but, similar in nature, sir. Yes, sir. But the point is, Mr. Speaker, sir, that there, are, there, there is a need for us to get this right. And, and we can only do that if we leave out some of the cheap politics and understand that we are now on a journey of redeveloping. Re, re, not reimagining, but rethinking what Barbados has been and could be, and utilizing to its fullest potential the, the, the abilities of our people, wherever and however they are to be resourced. And Mr. Speaker, sir, that is what these estimates largely are about. It is a program for the way forward and for a successful future. I'm obliged to you. Honorable Leader, Government Business. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, with that, I beg to move the suspension of the sitting until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, I just want to remind colleagues um, that given the shortened time for the estimates, I would ask that um, at least a 15, 20 minute be considered so that all members can try to get in their spe speeches in time and so that we don't delay the sitting as we have supplementaries as well to follow after uh, we finish the estimates debate. Thank you, sir. The question is that this honorable chair will be suspended until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, the 23rd of March, 2021. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. 
those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This Honourable Chamber stands suspended until tomorrow, the 23rd day of March 2021 at 10 a.m. in the forenoon.